So let me get started. Welcome everybody to 52 Living Ideas. Uh, today is a comprehensivist Wednesday that we do in association with the Greater Philadelphia Thinking Society. Um, always delighted to have Sanjay back talking about neuroscience. And I will let him introduce what he's talking about today. Sanjay, over to you. Okay, um, thanks Shikant. Um, welcome everyone. Uh, so today we, we have a, a slightly different format. Um, I, I, will, I have three short segments that I wanna go into. Um, and each of these are important, but they are very important for subsequent talks that we'll have, subsequent discussions that we'll have. Um, and, and really these, these kind of um, tie together in, in, in the concept we've talked about earlier in the last session and, and uh, even before that, we've talked about brain as, as a network of neurons or network of cells. And we're building off of that. Um, and the first part um, of these three, I'm going to really go into uh, discussing, you know, there's a theory that, that was uh, introduced last year uh, by some scientists from Stanford. It's, it's a substantial theory. They did a lot of work. Um, it took them several years to come up with all of the information and, and justify it. And it's not in neuroscience specifically, but, what, and, and, but it does have some parallels. It has strong parallels and they, they recognize this. And that, so this first part, it, they're really looking at an organism which is, um, uh, it doesn't have a brain at all. So, um, you know, the idea is how did a brain, any brain, any, any animal originate? That's what the first part we're going to look at. Um, the second part, I'm going to go into a little more about uh, networks, but look at it again, not from the brain's network, but basically from any cellular network. Um, and, you know, information, information is, at the center of our brain and mind, and it's the center of any uh, type of cellular network, any kind of network. So information is something we'll go into, um, and then we'll have a breakout. I think we'll probably have a breakout room after that, or possibly Q and A. Um, and then at the last segment, I want to go into a little more um, uh, about problems that can happen in the brain. And, and one specific example I'll talk about is uh, one of the dementias, Alzheimer's disease. And we'll go a little bit into that and how uh, the network of neurons gets affected by um, in, in Alzheimer's disease. So uh, let me start uh, first. Um, so in the beginning, we had uh, unicellular organisms. Um, basically, an amoeba is a unicellular organism. And this is the simplest form of uh, organism that we consider life. I mean, there are simpler ones, for example, viruses that are many people don't consider them life um, because they don't replicate themselves. They, they need to uh, take over the machinery from another cell. Um, so they actually lack a lot of the essential elements that um, uh, true life has. Um, so amoeba is one of the, the simplest forms of life. It's, it's a single cell. Um, and therefore, um, you know, we don't think of it as having a neuron because it itself is not really, it doesn't show the characteristics of a neuron. So in that sense, um, it uh, doesn't have a brain. And um, the next slide, I have uh, an organism that's called, a, this is actually a category of organisms called a plocozoan. Um, and this, believe it or not, it looks like it's one thing, but it's actually, you can't look at this image, um, but it actually consists of, of thousands of, and usually about three or 4,000, but uh, roughly a thousand on average, um, individual cells. And the cells are all very similar to each other. They're not uh, that distinct. It basically has, depending on who you ask, and depending on how it's categorized. In science, there are many, many, especially at this level of, of um, you know, life, which is so difficult to characterize because it has so few characteristics of life, um, whether it has four types of cells or six types of cells, it basically has very, very few types of cells. It actually consists of three layers. Um, one of those layers isn't even a, a cellular layer, it's just a fluid layer, water inside. So it has outer layer of cells and a lower layer of cells. And in the middle, it, it's like a sandwich. In the middle, it has basically water and fluid in which are floating around lots of proteins and uh, other types of uh, lipids and other um, elements which allow this organism to, uh, to do its thing. Um, and the upper layer and the bottom layer are actually very similar, very, very similar. Um, and so in that sense, it really has, you could say one, one layer of, of cells. Um, and it's a very unique, uh, and in this category, there are many types of organisms like this, but um, let me go to the, uh, next slide. So here, here's an example of one specific organism, uh, Trichoplax adherens, which is actually um, the organism that the researchers in Stanford, what they, what they studied this organism. And this slide is going to show, um, I don't know if it's visible on the screen, but basically 
um, there's a kind of a horizontal line toward the almost the half of the, of the uh, slide. And that horizontal line is, you can say, the surface that this organism is walking on. So this, this is what it actually does. It lives in the ocean. It's natural, naturally occurring organism. It's very small, around a millimeter in size. Um, and, and it's totally flat, as the previous image showed. And what you can see, you may be able to see it, is, is the top part of this, above this horizontal line, the organism is there. But beneath it, you see all these little filaments, these like hair-like projections. You'll see hundreds and hundreds of them. And those, each of those are a single cilia. Um, cilia is like a, like a hair. It's the simplest way to explain it. Um, but it's a hair, it's a, a cilia, a cilia is a, um, it's a, a projection out of a cell, which in many cases, the organism can, can move, but in this case, it can't really move it very much. It moves it very, very, um, in, in very specific ways. Uh, but what's unique, and let me start the video here. Um, I don't know, Shikant, is this visible? The, how much of that is visible? I don't know. Yes, it is visible. And you can see the, the filaments below? Yes. Okay, great. Right, so this is uh, the movie is, is slow motion, so we should be able to see it. So you can see the, the organism moving to the left. Um, and you, if you pay close attention, you can see some of these cilia are actually doing what's known as a walking gait. It's actually, they're acting in a coordinated fashion, which is very, very unusual, because I'll describe in a, in a, in a minute, you know, a little more about this organism. And it seems to be walking, which is phenomenal. Um, you know, and it's very slow moving. It's only a millimeter, you know, in, in diameter. So you can see that this is moving, you know, several uh, uh, micrometers, uh, you know, at a time. Uh, so it's very slow moving, but these cilia, you know, allow it to function, allow it to move. Um, now, what's unique about this, um, and I'm just going to pause it here. Actually, let me, I, I can, let me just keep it running. I mean, that will have something to, to watch. People can, can see more. And, and the unique part is in the lower part of the organism, there are basically two types of cells. One type of cell has these cilia, and there's another type of cell which helps it to, to function and to live and, and to digest food and things like that. Um, and it's a very, very simple organism. It does, it, it has no muscles. So literally it has no muscles. It has no neural cells. It has no brain. It has no, nothing um, that, uh, will, will, you know, anybody would consider, would, would characterize it as a complex form of life. Um, it's the most simplest form of life that actually does things. Um, you know, I mean, amoeba, you know, we, we looked at earlier, but amoeba basically floats around. It, it, it has very little control over the environment that it's in, it, it, uh, if something floats near it, it will engulf it. And you know, we believe sometimes it can kind of push itself, propel itself a little bit, but it, it has very, very limited motility, mobility. Um, this organism, on the other hand, has significant mobility. It can actually change direction. It can change its shape. Um, it can curl up. It can crinkle. It can do a lot of things. Um, so what's unique about this organism is the fact that it has no muscles and it has no brain. It has no uh, neurons. Um, it has nothing, no, none of its cells are uh, what you would normally think of as able to impart this type of behavior, walking behavior. And this clearly, if you look at the cilia, you see that the cilia, you know, they line up and they coordinate. One cilia moves and then one behind it moves again, one behind it moves again. They all act in a coordinated fashion, which is, which is phenomenal. Um, now, the the surprising thing, so let, let me just uh, pause and go to the next slide. So the surprising thing about this is how does this, this organism, uh, trichoplax adherence, how does it decide anything? How does it decide when to move? How does it decide when to stop? How does it decide when to turn? Um, how does it do any of this? And the reality is, um, you know, it has no neurons, it has no muscles, it only has cilia, which are hair-like projections. It doesn't have anything that will allow to do any such, such type of decision-making. and the, the research that the scientists did um, is that they um, examined in detail, and it took many, many years, and this organism is so, so small, it's very difficult to study. Um, it's even more difficult to find because in the deep ocean, you know, it's only a millimeter in size. Think about how, how you would find an organism if you're scuba diving, you know, that's only a millimeter in size. You'd be scouring, even if you're scouring a one meter by one meter area, it would take you hours and hours to scour that area of this organism. But they happen to locate, um, many of them, and, and they brought them back and, and studied them. Um, and what they found out is that the motion um, of these cilia are coordinated, but they're not coordinated through anything that we think of as decision-making. Um, they're coordinated in very unusual ways. 
Um, and one of the videos that I linked to, hopefully people got a chance to look at that video because that video does an excellent job. And I, I'm not going to be able to show it because it is copyrighted, but th that video to the end of it, you'll see a graphic which um, actually exemplifies the idea, the central idea that they, that they uh, used to explain this. And that's that if you have, you know, anyone who has, let's say a, a piece of luggage that you, you know, uh, move around in the airport that has four wheels or, or sometimes trolleys or even your shopping cart in a grocery store that has four wheels. And if you've seen these wheels, the wheels can move independently by themselves. But as soon as you start moving the, the trolley in a certain direction, all of the wheels align themselves in the same direction. They move in a coordinated way. Even though there's no brain, there's no thinking behind it, they move in a coordinated way. And that's because of the physical um, linkage between all of these things. And similarly, what happens is these cilia and the way the cells are linked together and the way that information, and I'm going to go into this in the next part, but because the cells are connected together, um, physical uh, forces acting on them trans, uh, transpose from one cell to the next to the next. And so when the organism, um, you know, if, if the ocean current exerts a pressure on the organism in one direction, and some of the cilia will start to orient in that direction, but others won't. So in a sense, it get, it, you know, it's not that it's getting confused, but it basically has two, it has multiple forces acting on it. But what happens over time and rather quickly is that most of the cilia align themselves with each other. And that is, again, it's not uh, thinking, it's not uh, neural, um, but they act in a coordinated way. So this is one of the surprising things that, that they learned in, in this study really, it, it does have a lot of um, uh, overlay, overlap into the neurosciences because it helps us to understand aspects of the brain at the extremely low level, okay? Um, so this organism, it moves autonomously. It has it under its own energy source, under its own, you might even say volition, okay? It moves itself um, and it seems to plan where to go. It seems to, you know, find food and eat it, and it seems to reproduce, um, and they can reproduce both asexually and sexually. So um, this organism seems to do things on its own without any sort of brain, and that's very unusual. So the question is, how does it do that without a brain? And that's what these scientists tried to answer, and, and the answer seems to be that you don't necessarily need a brain to do certain types of behaviors. And the, and the, um, uh, the, the, consequential understanding that we get from this, um, and, and the way I look at this, this uh, work that they did, is that there may be elements of this that actually go into um, our, how our brains are. So basically, um, you know, this organism has no way to decide on anything, right? It has no structures, internal structures to do anything that we would characterize as decision making, um, in, you know, in terms of the purpose of a brain or the function of a brain. Um, it's basically responding to external stimuli um, in a mechanistic fashion. Uh, but its behavior very much to anyone who wouldn't know that this, what this organism that lacks brains or muscles, anyone who doesn't know that, they would think that this organism is making decisions like most other, other organisms that do have a neural system. It, it seems to behave exactly as any other organism with, with a rudimentary brain, but it really doesn't. So that's the, the core of this. So the question is, is our brain similar at its simplest level, at, at the core level of our brain, in terms of if we look simply at a layer of tissue in our brain, not the entire brain, not, not regions of our brain, but if you simply take a small region of tissue in the brain that might have, let's say, a thousand neurons, okay, it would be, in, in morphology, it would be extremely similar to what this organism is, It'd be very similar to that. Can we say that a set of neurons in that structure would act the same way as this organism. And the research that they did suggests that yes, the answer may be yes, that at, our, at a simplest level, our brain, um, outside of the complex forces that act on the larger brain, okay, but at the simplest level, the smallest unit of our brain, the smallest uh, tissue sample in our brain, uh, may be driven simply by the external forces acting on it. Now, the difference with this organism and our brain is that our brain typically doesn't have physical forces like ocean currents acting on it. It has electrical forces acting on it. It has forces from, uh, you know, external stimuli from our sensory or, uh, uh, you know, uh, organs that that give it uh, that send impulses into specific regions, um, and those impulses 
though, are the same as any other force. They, they, they happen to be electrical, not mechanical, but there's still a force that's acting on brain tissue. And in terms of the uh, both the philosophical and the physics side of things, there's no reason to look at it any other way. And it doesn't seem to be that um, there's any other explanation for, for our brain to be doing the same thing that this does. So the question this really raises is, what is decision making really about at, at its deepest level? Um, is there a spiritual component now? You know, in our talks here, we've had a lot of discussions and people have talked about, uh, well, there, there, there may be quantum effects or there may be um, uh, you know, elements outside of the physical aspect of our brain that provides us with consciousness and other levels of behavior. So that's what I mean by the spiritual element. Um, is there that in brain um, or is it purely deterministic? Is it purely mechanistic? as this organism seems to be, or is it something in the middle or is it unknowable? Um, this is, this is you know, one of the things that we've been talking about in, in several um, discussions here, but this organism you know, puts this, this question at the crux. It really makes us wonder, how could this organism exhibit emergent intelligent, or not, I wouldn't go as far as say intelligent, sorry. It, it seems to show emergent decision-making planning behavior, which, you know, so far we've thought of only as arising from organisms that have some type of, uh, you know, neuronal uh, matrix, some type of rudimentary brain. This organism doesn't have anything like that. So, so really, what is decision making? That's what we're getting at here. Um, so let me, um, so that's the first part. Let me switch to the next part is where we're talking about information um, and all networks. And I'm going to put this forth as, as a as an idea, everyone may not agree with it, but, but in the neuroscience community, it is agreed with mostly um, that any network um, deals with information. And that's the central idea here. So um, actually, let me, let me be, before that, let me, let me just talk a little bit about this. Um, so information, so one, one um, uh, way to look at uh, a network. Okay, so first, let, let me talk about networks that are not neuronal networks that don't have to do with neurons or brain or any other thinking type of apparatus, right? Um, so a, a simple type of network of cells is our skin cell, right? Our skin surface. Our skin surface, if you look at it microscopically, microscopically it's basically you know, thousands and thousands of individual epidermal, you know, there are multiple layers, but if you look at any one layer of them, the dermal cells, many types of cells, and, and these cells are basically clumped together in a horizontal fashion, and they all uh, build a matrix. And a matrix is another word for a network. And our, so our skin is basically a network of cells. Now, our skin is a little more complicated because it has several types of, of cells. It doesn't just have skin cells, but it doesn't really matter. If, if you take hypothetically a sur surface area of, of the skin, which only has skin cells, nothing else, and, and there are areas like that, um, then you know, this would apply. And, and it doesn't really matter because if you have other types of cells, it's still a network of cells. It doesn't matter if there's if it's a homogeneous uh, matrix of cells or if it's a heterogeneous matrix of, of multiple types of cells, it, the same thing applies. And the idea here is that, and I'm trying to explain this in a simple way, so that's the reason why I chose skin cells because I, I think it's easy for people to imagine this. So let me think of this idea that I have a pencil, okay? And if I have a pencil and it's, it's, it's going into my hand and it's, let's say it's, it's hitting my hand, okay? So that pencil, um, is going to impart pressure on my hand and my hand has skin on it. So the skin in my hand is feeling the pressure from that pencil, okay? And the skin on my hand is going to respond in a way. Now it's not responding through muscles, okay? It's responding, <clears throat> excuse me, simply through the, acts, the, the forces of, of physics that the pencil, you know, somebody, I or somebody is pushing the pencil into my hand and the pencil is, translating that pressure, the force on the pencil into my hand, and that pressure into my skin of my hand is being dispersed across the surface area of my skin all around in a certain location, in a localized area of my skin. Now, what happens there is that the skin, um, if, if, so here, let, let, me, let me take three different scenarios de depending on the pencil, because the pencil you can, uh, connect to a skin in three different ways. You can take the sharp end of the pencil, right? The point of the pencil, you can put, uh, put it onto the skin, or you can take the opposite end, the eraser, eraser end of this pencil and put it on. 
or you can take the longitudinal, the long, the length of the pencil, and put it against, you know, against the the skin. So depending on how you do it, the forces acting on our hand will vary. So if you take the sharp point of a pencil and put it onto the hand, then the force will be localized to a very, very small area. And all of the forces will be concentrated in that area on our, in our, on our skin. And chances are, if you push hard enough, that it will actually rupture the skin and you'll you know, cause injury. Um, and so the skin will tear. But what, what is happening in that process is that the skin is taking all of the energy from the pencil, from the pencil point, and it's trying to disperse that energy throughout the skin. Okay. And the same thing applies no matter how you orient the pencil. If you take the eraser end of the pencil and do it, the same thing happens. But the force is distributed further. If you take the long end of the pencil, the force is distributed even wider across the screen. So what's happening is the energy in the pencil um, is being translated across the surface area of the skin. So in this case, you know, when we're talking about networks and information, the pencil is transferring energy into our skin and the skin is a network of cells. And we haven't talked about this in detail, but I've mentioned it you know, many times in, in previous talks and I'm going to mention it again, that energy is actually information, okay? And this is in, in the highest levels of physics. Um, this has been proven, you know, if you, if you, if you look at, um, if you look at uh, you know, Stephen Hawking and, and, and Pen, uh, Roger uh, Penrose and all of these other um, uh, uh, quantum physicists, they understand and accept, and there are many, many, uh, um, I don't want to say theory because they're actually accepted in, 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 a, in a popular uh, community. People think of theory as, as conjecture, but it's actually not conjecture. It's considered uh, almost like a law, but energy is, and, and information are considered the same thing. So if you, if you accept that, um, then you'll understand what I'm trying to say is that the pencil is imparting energy onto the skin and that energy is information. So for example, one, one, one type of information that the energy is giving onto the skin is the orientation, the shape of the pencil. So think about this, if you had your eyes closed and somebody put a pencil on your skin, you would be able to tell if they have the sharp point of the pencil or if they have the eraser end of the pencil or if the pencil is longitudinal, you know, horizontal on your skin without even looking at, at the pencil, just from the feeling on your skin. And that's an example of information because your mind is able to extract information from your skin that basically figures out the orientation of the pencil. And that's one way to understand that the type of pressure that the pencil is exerting and the surface area all across our hand, all of that constitutes information. So that information, when it goes into a cellular matrix, gets transported across, um, you know, and, and it could be either to long distance or it might be short distances, it might be even, uh, you know, it might be intermediate distances, but depending on the type of energy, the type of information that's being imparted, uh, this will cause uh, different types of effects into the, into the matrix, into the, the, the cellular network. Um, and so if we understand this, the same thing happens in the brain. Okay? The brain basically is only, and it's always dealing with information in the form of energy um, that's being imparted into its tissue. Okay? So any part of our brain, if you look at any part of our brain and whether the information is coming from outside or whether the information is coming from inside of us, it doesn't really matter, it's the same thing. That all, any kind of, ener any kind of energy, i.e. information that goes into tissue or a matrix in our brain um, is giving information. Now, typically this information isn't in the form of what a pencil does. It's not this distinct shape or this characteristic. A lot of times the information is going to multiple regions of our brain simultaneously. For example, when we have hearing, the hearing, the audio uh, information goes to, first it starts off in the temporal region, you know, both temporal regions of our, of our temporal lobes of our brain, but it basically disperses and it goes off into many, many areas of our brain. So the information is no longer a, uh, a succinct, you know, centralized form that this pencil in this example has. But the information is, is nonetheless, it's, it's dispersed, it's spread out throughout the tissue in multiple ways. It's similar to when we have a pencil resting on our skin or pushing on our skin, 
that information, that energy is dispersed all across the network. And it's, it's translated to multiple cells across the network. Um, and this is something that's important to, to understand. Now, um, the, next, the next part I'm, I'm, I'm going to talk about, this is related to information, but it's a little bit different. It's, it's more about um, when information gets transferred through a network, uh, how do other cells respond? So this is more getting into uh, when electrical signals in a neuronal network gets uh, passed through. So for example, when we, again, the, the same example with auditory, if we hear something, that sound, those sound waves go into our cilia in our inner ear, they go into the, um, the, the hair-like fibers that we have in our cochlea, they get translated to electrical signals which go into the temporal lobe and then they you know, get propagated through various parts of the temporal lobe into the parietal lobe, et cetera. They, get, they start to get processed. But what is happening is that as that's happening, um, you know, some of our cells may actually be not some, uh, cells are actually learning in the process. Every time we experience any kind of input from the external world, we actually have learning that happens in our brain. Though the learning is very, very microscopic. It's a very little li less in, in, uh, in degree. Uh, but it's still a slight amount of learning. So that's the part that I want to go into right now. And, and these slides, just a few slides, I think this is important for, for uh, uh, everyone to understand. So on the left side is are two neurons. And this slide actually is, is not completely correct, but, but this is the best that I can, I can do. So the, the, the top slide, the top neuron, the, the brown colored neuron should actually be reversed where the, uh, the dendrites are on the right but and, and in both. But for this you know, case, I think most people won't really, uh, it won't matter. So what's happening here is that this yellow neuron, there are two neurons, a brown neuron on top and a yellow neuron that's uh, you know, diagonal on the bottom. And the yellow neuron on the bottom is sending a signal out um, through its axon uh, to its uh, terminus uh, out here. And the brown neuron is um, in a state of, of growth. And many neurons in our brain are in a state of growth. They basically send out many types of neurochemicals, which basically inform other neighboring neurons that it is um, wanting to grow, that it, it, it is in a growth uh, environment. So this red circle here represents uh, neurochemicals, um, which are basically uh, chemical cues that this brown neuron is sending out in its vicinity and around itself that helps other neurons to connect to it. So this forms a gradient. So this yellow neuron, when it, when it senses this, especially the axon terminus senses this red region. And if this yellow neuron wants to connect to the brown neuron, it actually can. And this red area will help it coordinate and to actually connect. So on the left side, this red gradient area, the neurochemicals that are there um, are allowing it to grow. And this, you know, the, the right side of the slide shows where, and th this ha doesn't happen that quickly. This actually will take uh, possibly hours or days or even months to happen depending on the types of signals and the types of neurons we're talking about. It, would, it could take, you know, from, you know, again, hours to, to uh, days, um, possibly even months for this to happen. But basically what you'll see is that this yellow neuron, this segment right over here um, at the end of it has grown. And it's actually formed a synapse with the brown neuron where they've actually formed a, it's not a physical connection, neuro, neurons don't connect physically, but this is the closest that they will get to where information will flow between these neurons, a real synapse is formed here. And this is important to understand. And, and this is, again, this, this uh, happens not, not just with neurons, this happens with many types of, 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 of cells, where uh, cells help each other grow and connect and form this matrix. Um, and uh, th this is actually a slide showing where, where there's actually problems in, in this mechanism where the neuron doesn't grow, even though the, the brown neuron is sending out signals that it, it uh, 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 is in a growth spurt and wants to connect it. It's allowing other neurons to connect. It's almost like it's saying, hey, I'm over here. If you want to connect, come over here to connect. Um, and the yellow neuron in this case has a um, uh, genetic deformity, genetic abnormality, which prevents it from connecting. Um, so anyway, so let, let me just skip through these. So, so this what, what this, this last slide shows is that the effect is on, and this happens also not just with neurons, also many other types of cells, is that if the, the normal neuron is able to connect um, and able to send out these chemical messengers, 
this is what it would look like. You know, in the center is the cell body, and on the to the left, that thick, thick part is the axon, and all these other parts are dendrites. So this is a normal looking neuron. And the right side is abnormal neuron, which doesn't have this proper characteristic. And this happens for and there are many conditions, you know, that this happens under where um, a neuron would not uh, grow fully. And because of the, the differences between these neurons, this is one of the things that explains certain types of, of uh, diseases, even mental illnesses. This can basically uh, explain a lot of the um, developmental disorders um, post uh, birth that happens in people. Actually, some of these can uh, begin in utero, but, but these typically, uh, they progress after birth especially. Um, so these are examples where uh, the cellular network that we have um, would not be able to transmit information. So the ability to transmit information is central to not only the brain, but all tissue. But in the brain, when the ability to transmit information gets lost or gets degraded, then a lot of problems can happen. Um, and I, I'm going to skip this slide. So, so let, let, let's start stop here for now. And um, um, we uh, we can take either a, a I'm not sure if you can take yeah. do Q and A or a, let, a let let's do Q and A. Um, so I'm going to start off with a question, folks. Uh, this is a time to ask questions, uh, not uh, just clarificatory questions. Um, go ahead and type an exclamation mark. Uh, in the chat or raise your hand in Zoom in order to ask questions. Um, so I'll, I'll start with the question. Um, uh, Sanjay, this is really fascinating because what happens is that when people think about what goes on in the brain or what goes on in the mind, they always think of it at a very high level. What this, what your entire presentation is showing is that analogous things are going on at a very low level. So the concepts like energy, information, uh, movement, uh, direction of, when it, lots of the things which are there at the high level are already, are already taking place at a very low level. Um, and it shows, it's something fundamental about nature of life, that nature of life has these layers and it's not that it just begins right at the top, at the fully developed level, but at each level, there is life and there is responsiveness, there is the feedback loops there. And the higher ones rest on the ones below. And you can't really understand the higher levels without understanding how much the lower levels do. So that is what I'm getting from your presentation is that fairly along the lines of what, 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 what you're saying? Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it, I mean, I, I like how you explain it because it's, it's, it's actually at, at, at simultaneously at multiple levels, every organism exists. Um, and, and a lot of the things that we see um, are only uh, superficial at, at the outermost layer, you might say. Um, and we don't realize that underneath it, there are many things happening but the things that we see at the outermost layer, at the topmost layer, are actually sometimes they're, they're fundamentally driven by, they're shaped by, they're controlled entirely by the lowest level um, structures. Um, and, and, we, and we may not realize that. So, so biology, one, and this is not just biology, but biology is especially complex because of this, because there's so many levels, you know, when we, when we talk about um, genetics, right? Um, there's an brand, entire branch of genetics called epigenetics, which, which in the last roughly a decade and a half has really expanded. But that branch is so powerful. And that branch, basically what it says is as we live and breathe day to day, our genes are translating and our genes are being interpreted and our genes are affecting how our function, how our body uh, uh, behaves and acts and, and operates at a, from a millisecond to millisecond level. You know, our genes are still, our genes sim don't simply give us birth. They don't simply exist when, you know, when we're being born in utero and after we're born, they seize. It's not like that. If every single cell within our body at every millisecond is being operated from our, from our DNA, from the translations from our, and, and, and uh, our, in our, it, it's, it's, and, and, and at higher levels than that. So all of these levels simultaneously are affecting every aspect of our, of our being. 
Yeah, no, I, I really like the way in which you put it, that we are, this organism is living at all these levels at the same time. And you can't really understand the organisms without understanding all these levels and their interaction with one another. Uh, wonderful. Uh, next up is going to be Rich, uh, Vanessa, and uh, Johnny. Uh, Rich, go ahead. What's your question? Uh, Rich Rubin, would you like to unmute? Yeah, sorry. Uh, Sanjay, uh, I have uh, two questions, one on the first uh, 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 brief presentation you made and, and one on the last. Um, it seems that uh, for this simple organism you started with, um, uh, compared to others that have a uh, neuronal structure. It's, they're really similar. It's just a question of complexity. It seems to me, and I just want to confirm with you, that the real difference is uh, the simple uh, animal you talked about uh, earlier was based on uh, physical coordination or mechanical coordination, whereas uh, more complex uh, uh, organisms with uh, a nervous, a regular nervous system uh, use uh, action potentials and neurotransmitters. Uh, and, and am I getting that right? And my second question is on uh, when you were talking about the process of neurons connecting to one another, um, is the growth and directionality of that connection mechanism, does it use the same type of action potential signaling to direct that? Or are there other mechanisms that are used for growth as opposed to signaling once the, uh, you know, uh, uh, interneural uh, connections are in place? Thank you. Wonderful. Go ahead. Hey, uh so the, the 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 first question. So I, I didn't go into detail with the actual study that that the, the scientists did um, at Prakash Lab. It's in Stanford, and and I didn't do it intentionally because it's it's there's a lot of depth there. They actually they wrote um, three papers that I linked. I think there's a fourth paper also. There's a lot of lot of research that came out of this. Now one of the things that they came up with, uh, and and this is not this is not uh, speculation. This is not a conjecture or theory. This is what they found. They saw. Um, is that the behavior in each individual cell. So, so let me explain this way, that um, in the triplex uh, organism, the one that had the cilia which moves, um, in that organism, every single cell acts as a very rudimentary muscle and also as a rudimentary neuron. Okay? It seems to exhibit characteristics of a muscle cell, of a muscular cell. It seems to exhibit characteristics of a neuron but it's neither of those. It doesn't have the full mechanism of either of those, but it may be a precursor to what eventually evolved into something like an neuron. Now, one of the things that they see in this, in this organism, and especially when, when, when they analyze the movement of the cilia, is the movement of the cilia is very similar to um, what happens in a neuron when a neuron uh, begins to get activated, and then it reaches a certain threshold for the action potential, and it actually fires the action potential where it communicates to the outside. And what happens in this organism with the cilia is the exact same um, charging process, um, preparation threshold and charging process happens with the cilia and that the cilia in the beginning is, is you know, it's not motile, it's, it's basically flaccid. And the, the cell activates and then it gets the cilia ready and then it actually causes the cilia to move in a certain rotation where you know the cilia basically moves and it, it imparts a little bit of force you know a walking type of force on the organism so, but the behavior of this one cell is is very close to what happens in a neuron it's very very close to what happens in a neuron and that's the reason why they're conjecturing that this is the you know this is the precursor to a neuronal network because this organism in all of its senses well, when we see what it's doing it's doing the same thing as a as a network of neural cells, a tissue of brain, to, you know, a brain tissue segment, one millimeter uh, in size. What it would do is very similar to what this organism is doing, except instead of having electrical signals go out, this organism has a little hair-like projection which makes it move. So in that sense, um, 
it, 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 there's, there's strong parallels in this. So yes, it is moving from a mechanistic point of view, but if you look at it a little more um, inherently, it's actually the biomechanics and the biochemistry of it, which is so much more complicated. And the, bio, the biochemistry of it is, it's causing individual cells at different times to charge and discharge. And the charging and discharging process um, is coordinated through external forces on the organism from the ocean currents, you might say, or, or even its internal shape. So for example, when the organism is feeding, it takes on a concave shape. It basically envelops whatever it's eating underneath it, and it kind of forms you know, shapes like a hump. And, but these cells, the cells in the organism, um, I don't want to say they know it, but they have, they have forces acting on it, which changes its biochemical structure. Of, uh, but it's not the same change in every cell. Different cells have different changes in them, but the net topology of differences in all the cells creates a, uh, an environment where almost if you think of it like a, a flock of birds, right? A flock of birds flying. If you were to shoot an arrow through the flock of birds, um, you know, hopefully you miss the birds, but you know, you, what would happen is the birds would react to something traveling through them um, in an in a organic way. And the same thing is happening in this organism that if there's something else that introduces into it, all of the different cells are reacting to it in different ways. They're not reacting in the same way. It's not, it's not really that mechanistic as it, as it appears. Um, they all have individual, uh, I don't wanna say behavior, but they have individual uh, reactions. But, but the, the, key part, the, key part, the key idea around this organism that I want people to understand is that it appears exactly as emergent intelligent. Again, I'm using the word intelligent incorrectly. It appears exactly as emerge as, as an emergent um, deci decisionary behavior. It seems as if this organism is making decisions when really it, it cannot make decisions. So that's the idea because when we look at our brain, we we as people do the same thing. We add on this layer of assuming or hoping that our brain is making decisions on its own when it might not be doing that at all. It might be doing simply what this organism does. The second, the second part of your question around growth and directionality of, of, uh, of action potential. So action potentials actually do a lot of things in our brain. Um, one, the, the most important thing is that they're, they're actually communicating information you know, across uh, uh, near and far regions. What they also do is they also uh, cause um, growth. They also cause uh, memory formation. Memory formation is, uh, growth is memory formation. That, that's one of the, the hallmarks of it. And they also cause um, uh, um, the, the um, I don't want to go too much into this, but, but I've talked about this in, in the past. There, there are roughly 30, type, 30 different types of neurotransmitters that are present in the brain. And around most cells, you know, you probably, you, most neurons, you, you have around five or six types of neurotransmitters at any given time that, that are active. And all of, so that, that uh, neurochemical um, soup that the neurons are within also affect, uh, are also affected by and also affect, it's a two-way street, um, the way action potentials uh, function within, uh, within this matrix. Um, I'm not sure if this is uh, answering exactly what you asked, but but I mean, I think if you want, you can ask again. Uh, if that didn't answer exactly. That's fine. Let, let's try to get through as many questions as possible here. Um, I just want to say this is it's really fascinating. The first uh, your answer to the first question because this is what I find really amazing about studying evolution, that you look at something which is a more primitive organism, and you see it doing something which is very similar to what a higher organism is doing but in a different way. So you understand its nature. It gives you, you know, the kind of thing that life needs to do. And then you have these layers which make things more effective, faster, more responsive, more complex kind of action um, at, at a higher level. And you have these other uh, things. So it's just fascinating. Um, Vanessa, followed by Joe. Vanessa, what's your question? Okay, I was wondering, is it possible that there's maybe a commonality where there's like a change in energy, even like I've been floored as a kid, the Venus flytrap, you know, it's, it gets that triggered the little things on the end and, you know, it'll close around your finger or even like a plant knowing to grow towards the sunlight, you know, whether it's the ultraviolet or the heat, um, the difference in the heat when the sun is directly on it, like you move a house flat around, it'll eventually, you know, change its growth patterns. 
And similar with that, um, it talked about the changes like physical uh, orientation that may trigger that um, organism you, you mentioned in the video. Uh, with, did it have any action like with um, magnetic forces or uh, changes in um, uh, the temperature or, you know, uh, maybe even like subtle things that could be done. Like I said, it mentioned if it's physically um, tinkered with it a bit, it would cause it maybe to change direction or just be like, uh oh, okay, let's reset. I'm not sure what's happening here with like maybe too much change to overwhelm it. So is there like a catalyst that's maybe common to trigger an action, whether it's the, how the plant grows or simply the thing decides to move or the being the slide trap says, oh, I think I got a bug in me, time to eat. Um, so, I mean, you're, you're comparing the Venus flytrap and, and trying to, I guess, understand or extrapolate possibly if similar things are happening in this organism and also in our brain. Um, and um, I, I remember reading, you know, years ago about the Venus flytrap, the, de the details of what makes it move, et cetera, things. I, I don't remember as much detail anymore, but um, it is biochemical action. It's not simply, um, uh, it's not magnetic, definitely, but it's, it's not simply um, electrical potential that's doing it. It's, it's, it's a comp, I remember there was a complex set of um, uh, processes that, that cause it to, and actually it doesn't snap. Uh, I mean, to our eyes, it appears to be very, very rapid, but there are moments where it can actually do it in slow motion. In some cases, it actually does it very, very slowly for certain types of organisms. Um, but the question you're asking is, is the type of energy that, that's involved in, in these, in all these types of uh, organisms. And, um, and I think you had a question around magnet magnetism, if that could be tied into this. Um, I mean, any, any organism that uses electricity, true electricity, um, would have, there would be a magnetic uh, uh, aspect to it. I mean, I was going to say pole, but it's not a, a pole is a, is a technical term. It's not that. But uh, magnetism and electricity are, go hand in hand. They, they are two sides of the same coin. Um, and, and so anything that has real electricity flowing in it will have magnetism and vice versa. This is the reason why with in neuroscience, we can actually force changes into a person's brain by imparting magnetic pulses. There's actually devices that have been, that exist that are used in research. Um, and they're somewhat used in treatment also now um, where they actually cause a certain type of magnetic field of certain strength to be imparted into a region of the brain and it actually causes changes in that person. It, it, it causes knowable, measurable changes in that person. So magnetism is, is a real thing that affects um, tissue. Um, especially tissue that has electrical signals. Um, the, I, the one idea that, that, you know, that sparked my interest, curiosity in, in, in your question is that you talked about, you know, you started talking about the change in energy with the Venus flytrap, but you know, what we're talking about with all of these organisms, including our brain, is a change in energy. The change in energy is what causes all of these things to happen. Change in energy, um, no matter how you look at it, the most, from the most fundamental, um, uh, activity happening in our brain to the most complex activity with our brain. All of them have this term called change in energy, a change in action potential change, and, and usually in, in complex behavior, there are many, many millions of things that are happening. There are millions of changes of energy in mo millions of places happening, but it all characterizes uh, changes, slight tiny changes in energy all across a large, uh, you know, humongous brain. So change in energy is central to everything we're talking about. And that to me ties even further together this idea that if we're talking about changes in energy across the matrix of cells, okay? And the cells don't have to be neurons, right? Um, if a change in energy across matrix of cells, it causes them to behave in a certain way, then fundamentally is intelligent behavior, nothing more than that, right? I mean, I think it is more than that, but but, at the simplest level of, of brain tissue, um, we can actually explain it by saying simply changes in energy across the, the tissue is, is doing this. Wonderful. Um, Sanjay, I mean, this idea of thinking of everything in terms of energy, uh, you know, information, everything in terms of energy, I think it's very powerful. If you get time, would love to discuss that. Um, next up is going to be Johnny followed by Joe. Johnny, go ahead. Uh, thank you. And thank you so much, uh, Sanjay. This is an amazing subject and the way that you're all covering it is just, it's mind blowing. Um, I, uh, my question is simple and may be slightly off topic, but I think it may also be revealing in some way. Um, the, uh, this, uh, uh, 
living entity, this organism, the uh, uh, what we're we calling this, the trico trichoplax uh, yeah. adherence. Um, if it has a motion, but it doesn't have anything that's muscle-like, what is actually causing that motion? What is causing the cilia on its essential level to be able to bend and move? What, there must be some kind of energy or what I would think of as a muscle, something that expands and contracts. So I hope that might reveal something about the energy behind uh, you know, all of this stuff I'm thinking. Does that yeah. make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, and so um, an earlier question when, when um, Rich asked this, I, I tried to go into this. I'll go a little more detail into this. So, if 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 you haven't had a chance, I would recommend everyone um, watch the first video in you know in tonight's meetup. I had listed some uh, suggested sources. The first video, and I can post it in the chat if people don't have it. But the first video really will help you understand this this entire area, and it's it's central. I think if if you watched it, you will get a lot more out of it. Um, but that video explains parts of what I'm about to say. I mean, it does it in a succinct way, and, and obviously, you know, when you have vi visual information in front of you, it helps us to grasp exactly what, what the ideas are. So what, what the individual cells in this organism in tr trichoplax adherence, what it's doing is, it is using biochemical energy, okay? That's the type of energy that's at, at root, and biochemical energy is at the root of every living organism. Every living organism uses biochemical energy. Biochemical energy is, is um, in the, the energy between molecular bonds, okay? and the transfer of energy between different molecules and the timing and the stochastic processes between these, all of these things put together are what define uh, biochemical energy. So in this organism, in its individual cells, what happens is, is very similar to what happens in a normal muscle in organisms that have muscles. It's also very similar to what happens in a neuron in organisms that have a neuron. And what, what happens, and let me just explain in, in these three types of cells, in, in, in this organism cell, in a muscle cell, and in a neuron cell, um, what happens is there, there's a certain point at which, um, so, so they're, they're charge, they're charge uh, buildup, okay? So I, hopefully, if, if you under, do you understand that? Is that something I should go into? Okay, okay, so, um, um, so charge buildup is, is, is a very important part of biochemistry. And charge buildup happens when ions, very simple uh, molecules, Usually they, they, they can be a, a single atom or, or two atoms paired. Um, when ions flow into or out of a certain region, and if many of the same type of ions flow into a region, um, then the charge that those ions carry, either positive or negative charge, will build up in that region, will build up inside that sac, you might say, or that inside that cell. So a cell can have ions uh, build a charge in a positive direction or negative direction. Um, and you can actually have simultaneous, you can actually have multiple types of ions. You can have potassium, so for example, in our neurons, potassium and calcium are two ions that are very important and they're always moving in and out. And it's not simply, and even though they both have a positive potential, they, they don't have the same behavior. They both act in different ways, even though they're both positive. So it's, it's very complicated. I'm not going to go into that, but what happens is because in a cell you have charge gradients and gradient is a, is a, a region, a distribution of the charge from zero to positive or zero to negative. Um, and the, the gradient within the cell and along the surface of the cell, the gradient can be different places. So for example, in a neuronal cell, the gradient on the body of the cell near the, near the nucleus tends to be very different than the charge buildup across the axon, that, that section of the, of the neuron that carries electrical signal down. They're very different and, and, and the dendrites are very different. So different parts of the cell, you can have very different types of, of charge densities and charge collections. And depending on, on the internal structure of the cell and how these charge buildups happen, different things will happen. That energy will move within the cell and the movement of that energy will cause things to happen. It might cause other molecules to behave. It might cause, um, you know, it might cause many different things to happen, functions and, and biochemical processes to begin or end. In this, uh, in this uh, organism cell, one of the things that it does is it affects the movement of the cilia. So these charge imbalances will eventually cause the, um, the cilia, which it's not exactly a hair, but we can think of it as a hair. It's, it's more complicated than a hair, but, um, and, and hair is, is, is a dead tissue. In this, it's, it's not a dead tissue. So, so the cilia of the, of the cell, and each cell has only one cilia, that cilia is activated um, because of the charge buildup inside the cell. It's activated to enact motion, to move. It literally moves. Um, and in a neuron, when that charge buildup happens, it doesn't move anything. It, it sends that energy down its axon 
um, downstream to the next cell. So in that sense, it's the exact same thing happening. When the biochemical machinery of the cell determines that, that it's ready for the action potential to fire, then in this organism, the cilia moves. In a neuron, the, um, uh, the, the uh, axon uh, has a pulse uh, traveling along it. In a muscle, the muscle cell contracts. So all of these all of these different types of cells, they basically do different things at the end, but the internal mechanism is, is you know, they're related. They, they, they uh, operate in a similar fashion. Wonderful. So that's one of the reasons, the important point here is that this is one of the reasons why this is, I found this to be such an important uh, work that they did the study, because the processes involved in simple motion of this organism mimics both a muscle cell as well as a neuronal cell, but it's neither of these cells. It's a, it seems to be a precursor type of cell, but it, it shows very similar characteristics to what a neuron does. Wonderful, wonderful. So folks, we're gonna go through all the questions and so that we can get to the next part of the presentation. Um, again, here I, you know, uh, I'm, I want to do an uh, analogy with physics. Like most people, when they think of physics, they think about the billiard ball physics of Newton. Uh, and but there is another way of thinking about physics, the same thing. You can think of it in terms of this dance of potential and kinetic energy and of minimum paths and fields. And it is much more closer to the biological way of thinking of saying, okay, what is, what is building up? You know, where is the potential building up and where is it being discharged and how is this dance going on? So you can think of it in like mo most people implicitly when they approach science, much of their formulation is in the Newtonian way, which it makes it harder for them to actually appreciate what is happening in biology. But something like uh, the, the energy formulation and like minimum path formulation, least action formulations are much more closer to, to biological way of thinking. Uh, any, any, any thoughts about that? For me? Yeah, yep. I mean, I, I completely, I mean, the, um, I mean, Newtonian mechanics or Newtonian physics is is a simple way to explain um, very large scale behavior in the world, right? So a billiard ball is fairly large, a planet is fairly large, you know, our bodies when we're moving through space, a tree falling, all of these things are fairly large processes. But most of what happens in the world happens at small scale. When evaporation of, of, of water, you know, off of a off of a, a lake is is something we can't see, you know, with our eyes. It's very small scale, so at a molecular level. Um, the cloud formation in the sky, you know, when rain falls from a cloud, it begins at the molecular level. Most of the things that happen in the world happen at molecular level, molecular scale, and they're not really uh, observable unless we know, you know, unless we've learned about it or we know to, to you know, exactly what's happening. Yep. And in biology especially, it's, it's extremely important to understand it from this point of view. Yeah, so, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm just making the, the uh, 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 I agree fully, uh, I'm, I'm finding that just like, you know, kind of understanding the simple organism, you can see the same kind of things happening. When you actually look at energy operating in even non-physical things, you will see some patterns of the way in which things move from potential to kinetic, which will enable you to understand what is going on at, you know, in, the, in these basic uh, levels. Wonderful. Uh, next yeah, up is going to, go ahead. I just want to add one, one quick point on this to just to make it more vivid with in terms of animal behavior. So I, I had I, in, in one of my previous uh, talks, I, I had slides around this, but, but I'll talk about it. And in the future, I might have something similar to this to explain it. But, but in the slide that I had earlier, um, I showed a dog, the galloping and gait motion. And if you think about it, when or, or horse for that matter, you know, any animal that, that, that gallops, um, the movement of its four legs are very mechanistic. They're based in pure physics, right? The, the, the force of the hoof or the force of the leg touching the ground, the reaction force, you know, uh, repelling the, the muscles, what it's doing to cause the movement of the leg, all of these things are very mechanistic. But what's happening inside the brain of that animal is very, is, is completely biophysical. It's, it's biomechanical, but it's also biochemical. The brain is making the decisions on which leg is to move at any given time. And the reason why I brought up this example is that the movement in something as simple as a gallop or a trot that animal does. We think of it as a complex motion, but in, in one of the earlier talks that I did, I described that basically four neurons are all you need 
to create that type of complex behavior. Four neurons, that's all it takes. Wow, wow. wonderful. Um, so we're gonna to go to um, uh, questions from Madeline and uh, Dave next, and then we will go to the second part of the presentation. Madeline, what's your question? Okay, uh, thank you, Sanjay. Thank you, Shrikant. Uh, this is one of my favorite organisms. It's kind of a boundary, inhabits a boundary, kind of like viruses. You know, you're right at the edge of something. Um, so my question, it's kind of in the realm of, uh, I think, Vanessa's question. Uh, this mechanical flocking behavior of the cilia, um, and I don't know if this is known, uh, is the trichoplax moving towards something? In other words, does it have chemosensory cells? And if so, um, do those cells orient it to a nutrient gradient in the water? Or is it just moving at random? Because this seems like it would have implications for the level of intentionality uh, that is possible or not possible uh, with a mechanical system that has no neurons. Okay, um, excellent question. Um, and I mean, I, I haven't studied this organism obviously in detail, but what I've read of, of it in, in, in their papers um, and what I know a little bit about it, um, I can answer this, but Again, I'm not saying that, that I have a complete answer, but from my understanding is, the, you know, the, the question you're asking specifically would, would be important in terms of its food seeking behavior, because if it has chemo sensors, chemo, uh, chemo receptors, um, it would somehow have the ability to uh, um, discern the type of material, the type of matter, the type of molecules in its vicinity and in which direction they tend to be, and it might be able to orient itself. Um, the quick answer is it doesn't seem to have any such cells. They, 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 uh, in, there, there's been detailed examination of the organism in terms of the, all the types of cells it has. Now, one, one caveat is that um, even in the last, I think in the last uh, six or seven years, we found that there's two other categories of the same animal. Prior to that, um, or uh, more than 100 years, we thought there was only one type of this animal of, of the uh, trichoplex adherens. And in, in the last five or seven years, we found two different versions of it also. So there may be other versions that we don't know about, but the ones that we've found so far seem to show at most six types of cells. None of those cells are chemosensors. None of those cells give it any kind of um, chemosensing ability, the type of ability that, that you're asking about. Um, but what it does seem to do is it, it seems to wander about on the seafloor bed, kind of searching. It eats basically um, uh, organic matter that's, that's uh, uh, either decomposed or fallen off from, from other animals and other, other uh, creatures. Um, and, and they're microscopic little uh, you know, uh, items that are resting on the seafloor. And it kind of scours and, and, and moves around until it, it, it eventually comes across one of those but it's able to sense, and it, 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 now we're not sure if it, I use the word sense incorrectly, it's not that it's sensing it, but for various reasons, it is able to stop and start to digest it. Now that's the part that I myself am not 100% sure whether it stops when it's digesting or if it simply glides over it and it, as in the gliding process, it continues digesting it. I suspect it does stop, stop. and that also would be, a similar similar aspect because the, organ, the six types of cells that it has, um, those cells are able to. One of these types of cells is a lipid is a lipid cell, um, which we have also. Um, and what lipid cells tend to do is they 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 can uh, sense hydrophilic hydrophobic surfaces. They they can um, they they have special characteristics that would give it ability to. Uh, I wouldn't say sense, but the uh, the electrical potential and the, the electrical potential, especially in the uh, nature around the lipid cell, it, it's not a cell, lipids, or, you know, it, it's 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 similar to a bubble, um, but it's it's considered a cell in this organism. Um, it tends to cause changes in its neighboring cells, which are more traditional types of cells with with uh, cell body and and uh, uh, nucleus. So what happens is all of the different types of cells communicate in a sense. And it may be that when it glides on top of something that might be a food source, that it might be edible to it, it 
senses a change in potential in some of its cells. And that information gets translated into other cells, which eventually makes it to the cilia, which make the cilia stop moving. And so it, it stops moving. One of the things it does do, that's observed to do, is when it finds a large enough morsel of food, it actually forms a concave surface, which almost surrounds that. Um, it doesn't just float above it. It almost sort of forms a bubble around it to give more surface area to help it to digest it faster. So, but again, it's not, it's not sensing uh, the food. It's, it's simply reacting to the presence of something um, that has certain chemical characteristics that might make it um, dissolve and, and be absorbable by it. Excellent wonderful. question. Yeah, wonderful question. And I wanted to comment on one aspect of that question. You know, Madeline started by saying, oh, that's one of my favorite organisms. Now there are 8.7 million species. So how come can there be a valid statement? This is my favorite. And there is a reason, like she explained, what happens is that there are some species which are like at the, at the edge. And for science, focusing on those species is a very powerful way of moving things forward because they are, if you just focus on those, you can really understand things very fast. So great, great point, uh, Marilyn. Next up is going to be Dave followed by Laura, and then we'll go to the second part. Dave. Yes, thanks, Rikhan. Very interesting, Sanjay. I'd like to explore the pointed object against my skin quickly if I could. It seems to me for the brain to understand it needs a confirming signal. I think we think of uh, touch as detecting pressure. And so this pointed object is deformed my skin and there'll be pressure there. But in physics, whenever there's pressure, there's gonna be tension. And so the surrounding skin is stretching because it's being deformed. So that would be a confirming signal. And the other thing is you, I might look down at my hand where the pencil is pointing. Oh, that's what's happening. But I want to bring up another point real quick because I was at a medical exam a couple of days ago and the nurse was testing my reactions and she gave me a very light brushing touch against the sole of my foot. And it was a completely different feel and it reminded me of tickling. If you tickle somebody, you just barely touch them. There's no pressure involved at all, it's just a brush against the skin. But uh, yeah, it's a very interesting uh, concept. Thank you. Yeah, you, you raise a point that that's actually very important. And, and I started going into this in one of my earlier talks. Um, You're talking about touch. Um, and touch actually, we think of it as a single sense. It's actually not a single sense. Um, our skin is the organ um, that imparts touch. But touch actually, in, in depending on the theory, depending on who you you uh, consider to be correct. Many, some scientists consider touch to have 34 different elements, okay? And on average, it's considered to have at least 12 or 12, 12 to 15 different elements. So for example, you, you talked about stretching of the skin. Um, that's one. Um, you talked about a soft feathery touch, um, tickling sensation, that's another. Touch, what we tr traditionally think of as pressure, that, that's another. Temperature, a temperature actually is hot and cold both. So uh, pain, you know, so there's many, 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 sensations that are all part of our touch sensation. And so the example that I gave with, with the pencil is that, and, and with some, something you talked about, the confirmatory signal. Confirmatory signal, there are actually two types of confirmatory signals. One is, is when you talk about with your eyes, with our eyes. That is a different type of confirmatory signal. That, that's not confirmatory in terms of the skin organ, right? That's confirming from a completely different modality in our, in our brain, right? We're no longer using that organ itself. We're using a completely different organ to cross check or double check what's going on here. What, is there something, is there an insect crawling on my skin or is it just that I'm imagining it? Um, and, and, and that's something that happens in our brain. But even if we don't have confirm, confirmation with our eyes, our skin itself can provide confirmation through the, the multiple myriad types of, of uh, sensors that are built into our skin. And you're right that, that we would have to have confirmation from multiple sources, but the, 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 there are two that almost always give our brain at a low level, at the lowest level our brain knows with good certainty when there is something pressing against it, even though our conscious mind may not be aware of it. So when we're what I'm talking about here is not the conscious mind's awareness of it. I'm talking about at the brain, at the lowest level of the brain, the brain having information that there is something on the skin. That would happen, um, uh, that doesn't require confirmation, but nonetheless, there would be multiple types of confirmation sent into the brain, you know, no matter how you have the spinal touch in the skin. Wonderful. Uh, Laura, what's your question? 
about a million questions. This has been really interesting. You get two. Uh, how about two instead okay. of a million? All right. Maybe the first question. How good are you at reading EMGs? Can you do that? No, that's no. not the next one. Uh, damn. Um, okay. Well, I was uh, I was reading one, and it seemed like there were two like multiple levels, like uh, for a single. Um, thing, you know, like it would be like one level and two levels. And then some level there would be a response and on another level at the same thing, there wouldn't be a response. So as you talk about this kind of thing, I was wondering if in looking at the nerve response, which this test was, and it was coming up with that, is that sort of the kind of thing that you were also talking about, you know, cause this was specific to looking at nerve. And I don't know how that looking at that response relates to when it goes to the brain. I don't know if that goes that far or just stops at the, at, the, at the test level. So first, I mean, when you're talking about EMGs, EMGs aren't looking at a single nerve. I mean, when you're talking about the testing that, that, that is involving a single nerve, or usually it's a nerve cluster, it's not a single nerve. Those are different tests. They're not, they're not using EMG, but the actually the apparatus looks different. But, but in EMGs, the... Um, the signals are collecting in a, a large brain region. They're not able to discern on a single neuron or even a small cluster, um, and definitely not not nerves. Um, EMGs are looking at uh, firings in across uh, areas of, of the brain. Um, I, you know, you asked if I can read them. It's not I'm not able to read them, but I can interpret some things about them. But that's not um, you know I'm not trained in that at all. That's not that's not my area. You're when you're trying to understand what's happening with um, you know, the analogy with, with a pencil touching our skin and the signal going into our brain, um, that would not be picked up by EMG. Um, and it would, but it would be picked up by, uh, um, I'm, I'm trying to remember, that there's actual device which um, is used to measure the signal transduction through a nerve. But through those types of devices would be able to measure it. But you'd have to know which nerves to look at ahead of time. Wonderful. Uh, all right, Sanjay, this, uh, this was great to do a Q&A in the middle. Let's continue with the second, second part of the presentation. Okay, um, so let me just put the slide again. I have to find where uh, I think this is the one. Actually, no, that's not it, me. Uh, sorry, I my slide reset back. I, let me just forward it a little bit. No problem. I don't know why uh, so folks, we are going to have a second part of the presentation and then we will do one more Q&A. So please keep track of all the questions that you have. Okay, so it should be visible now? Yes, go ahead. So, so now we'll, we'll go into dementia. And, and again, this is, I'm not going to, this is not, we're not going to study Alzheimer's or, or talk about um, what's happening. And, you know, I'm not going to go in detail with Alzheimer's or, or you know, therapy or, or, or a diagnostic or anything like that. This is a very simple um, presentation based on what happens with a, a, a network of, of cells. And Alzheimer's is an example that I'm using to show that there are uh, many things that can happen, but, but at the simplest level, um, what actually happens. Um, and so the first, um, my slide was not forwarding, sorry. Um, so um, I, um, I, I have in the beginning just a few slides that, that talk about um, some, uh, these are MRI uh, images. So here you, you have um, and, uh, slides of actual brain scans in a person. And on the left side, you see this, this light gray region to the bottom right side in the parietal lobe. And um, this is, excuse me, this, this uh, is showing real plaque formation measure. It's the MRI is measuring actual changes in the brain tissue in this person. Um, and what this is showing, this yellow arrow is pointing to it. What this is showing is that there are amyloid uh, beta plaques. Um, and, and I'm gonna, in a minute, I'll, I'll go a little more into what, what that means. Um, so when, when, people have, when, when people have dementia or uh, Alzheimer's, um, what happens is, is their brain consists of, a, of you know, 86 billion neurons up to 100 billion neurons. And all those neurons are connected into multiple networks. And all of those multiple networks 
are interconnected into, within themselves. So earlier when we talked about the multiple levels of existence and multiple levels of operation within an organism, even our brain operates at multiple levels. So one of the levels is that in brain tissue, you will have signals and signal flow. But that brain tissue, the, the cortex, which is only one part of our, our, of our cerebrum, the cortex itself has six layers of neurons. And so there's information between the layers of neurons. There's information across a single layer. And this is all within the, cor the, the cortex. And then the cortex sends information across axons to other parts of the cortex. That's another layer of information flow. But then you have other parts of the brain. You have the, the uh, 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 you know, parts of the limbic system, which is the subcortical regions, um, you know, a big little hippocampus. Uh, you, know, uh, you have the cerebellum in the back, the, the pons, the, the uh, um, the brainstem, we do all the got it. All these other regions, all of these regions together are very, very different. So, just the brain itself has multiple layers of information and communication happening simultaneously and over time and space. So, it's a very complex organ. The information flow is very complex. And because all of these layers are individual networks or can be seen, can be represented as individual networks, if any of these networks has a disruption in it, has damage in it, it will cause problems in the person, in that person. And this slide is showing large scale, this is relatively large scale damage because this is a, you know, it, this would be, you know, more than a quarter in size of a quarter, you know, larger, larger than the size of a quarter um, lesion in the brain where plaque has built up. Um, and the right side, they, they did the same imaging using a different, they actually uh, removed the radio tracer and, and they, they looked at how the, um, this region of the brain reacted. And you can see there's a different, type of signal, you can, there's a smaller uh, um, signaling. But anyway, I'm not gonna go into detail there, but basically the difference between these, these two images helps them to understand and confirm that this person actually had has a plaque buildup. But that doesn't mean that they necessarily have Alzheimer's or that, that they necessarily have a disease. It simply shows that plaque has built up. Um, and this is another uh, slide where, and this is on the left side, the central left, uh, side of the brain. This is more toward the, the core area. So this is no longer the cortex. This is more toward the, the subcortical regions where they have plaque buildup. And this is significantly stronger because it's a deeper white color and a similar uh, um, complementary signal on the other slide, the right-hand side. So, so these are two slides that basically show um, plaque buildup. And first, I'm just going to talk about plaque and, and, and example. So this is a, a slide of, of, of what uh, is a normal type of network of neurons. And in this, you might not be able to notice, but there's a, there's a neuron over here. Um, there's a neuron over here. There's another one up here. There's another one up in the corner here. There's one down at the bottom left. There's one toward the, the bottom right, another one here, and there's one just off, off center. So there's several neurons, about you know, seven or eight neurons in, in this slide. Um, and th and this, this slide only has a certain confocal depth. So basically the imaging system, the camera system, you might say, can only... Um, focus in at a certain depth in the tissue. And this tissue is much, much deeper. So if you if we're able to focus deeper into the tissue, we'd see more neurons. And if we're able to focus even earlier in a high, at higher, closer to us in the, in the image, there'll be more neurons. So this, this tissue actually is in a three-dimensional structure. It's not, here we see a two-dimensional thin slice of the neurons. But nonetheless, if we have this type of structure, I wanna show what happens over time as plaque builds up. Um, so, here, here's an example where you know you might see a little bit of you know like the whitish regions in, in, in the image. There are a few white spots that have formed, and then you see a few more white spots that have formed. And so these white spots that have formed, what they're doing is they're actually obstructing signal flow. They're obstructing the ability for information to flow between neurons. And these these interconnecting lines either are axons or they're dendrites. But axons and dendrites both are the you might say the highway, the channels through which information flows. Either it enters into a neuron or it exits out of a neuron. But it's always flowing um, in one direction um, through these channels. And these plaques, um, these white regions that we see appearing in this image, are obstructing that information flow, the flow of, of electrical charge um, through this. Now, plaque also are doing other things. Now, I've talked about this in other, slot, in other talks, but inside our brain, we don't have simply neurons. We have several other types of cells. There's support glial cells. There, there are many types of, of cells. So there are blood vessel cells, which, which you know, feed, which uh, provide nutrients and oxygen um, to, to, our, to our brain tissue and remove uh, waste and remove heat. 
and things like that. So, so there are many other types of cells within our brain, not just neural tissue. So this plaque affects all of those other cells also. This plaque is very, very damaging. It damages lots of things in our brain. Um, so as you can see from these images, these plaque are disrupting the network structure, the network connections of the cellular matrix. Um, and as we progress further and further, over time, it gets worse and worse. Um, and it, it gets, it, and it continues. And, and this, this is, you know, this latter part is simulated because these are not, you know, um, real, but I'm simulating here what would happen. And actually people never get to this point because they died long before this. But if it continues further, it would completely obstruct and, and basically obliterate all of the cells in, 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 the, um, in, in that area of brain tissue. There'll be nothing left. The cells literally die. And in the last slide, I'm showing that basically the remnants of these cells, these black regions are, are what's left. The cells basically disintegrate. They die. Literally, they die over time. Now, um, let me uh, go into a little bit of the, of the biochemistry of it. I don't want to go too much into it, but just I want to give a little bit of understanding to people about what's happening. So this slide, I'm going to zoom in on the, on the image part of this slide, um, just to give an understanding of this. So the, starting from the left side and flowing toward the right, is this is describing the process of how plaques and how particles form. So the left side is the inside of, of a neuron or inside of, of many cells, but neurons in particular. And neurons have, have a, uh, a molecule called an APP. It's an amyloid precursor protein. Um, and that's this, this uh, orangish molecule, the long molecule that you see on the top left, which seems to have three segments. It's actually more complicated. It's not, it's not uh, this way. but but the APP molecule gets cut up at two different times. And I'm not, I'm not going to get into detail here, but basically it gets cut up and, and the first segment gets cut up inside the cell. And, and these, uh, what seem to be scissors in these semi-circular um, uh, regions, these are actually enzymes that do this. Um, so there are two enzymes that are important in this. And they cut up this APP molecule into three segments. And two of the second, one of the last first segments stays within the, the neuron, but the other two segments uh, are outside of the neuron. They are, they have a purpose outside of the neuron for uh, you know various things. But what happens is is both of these uh, segments can agglutinate, but one of these segments in particular, which is called the amyloid beta segment, that actually uh, uh, it, it sticks together more uh, easily than the others. Now this agglutinating behavior is normal. Okay, this is not part of the disease. This is normal. Every, everybody's body and every, these amyloid beta particles are supposed to agglutinate to some extent. The problem is if they agglutinate too much. Um, so in people who have a history in their family, there's a history of, of uh, uh, Alzheimer's disease. Um, they have a genetic, genetic disorder which causes their, uh, their APP molecule to be of a different shape. And also, other people also have this amyloid uh, beta segment of the APP molecule, which also will be of a different shape and a different characteristic. So in those people, it may be either more sticky or, or for other reasons, because for biochemical uh, characteristics of it, it would cause it to clump together even more. And this clumping together progresses over time. Okay? And that's what this picture shows. And I'm not going to go into the other areas. We see antibodies here. I'm not going to go to that right now. Um, we can talk about that later. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm thinking about doing a talk in the future um, with neuro neurodegenerative disorders, including uh, Alzheimer's, um, but I don't want to do that right now. I want to talk mainly about the plaques and how they disrupt the network um, and, and problems that can occur from that. So you see the single amyloid beta uh, molecule here on the, on the uh, center left side, and then you see a, a bunch of them, a few of them clumping together. And then you see them clumping into a larger segment, uh, almost a linear segment. And this is called a fibril. Basically, it's, it's, a, it's a, you know, visibly it looks like a little, little uh, you know, it's not always straight, but, but it, it's, it's a fiber type. And then that can enlarge and eventually it enlarges to such a uh, size and the size can be very, very large that these are called plaques. And plaque is, you know, in, in dentistry, people have heard of plaques where you have plaque forming on your teeth. It's that type of thing. It's, it's, it's a material, it's a, you know, these are based on molecules, but they're, they're molecules that have clumped together in, to form this material, which grows and grows over time. And, and after this plaque forms, other amyloid particles and other fibrils will stick to it also. So this, this uh, 
this uh, plaque in the top right corner, this orange uh, roundish shape, will tend to enlarge more and more. Now, with, in people with, with, uh, who exhibit symptoms of Alzheimer's, it typically takes around 25 years you know, from the time that these uh, amyloid beta plaques start to form, the initial earliest formations of these plaques, it can take up to 25 years for them to actually start to show signs of Alzheimer's. This is one of the reasons why uh, Alzheimer's is seen in the elderly because at the time it takes. But there are many, several types of Alzheimer's which do begin as early as age 20. We've seen in, in many patients as early as age 20 where they, excuse me, where they have significant degradation of, excuse me, of function and, and they start to show uh, signs of Alzheimer's as early as age 20. So it's not limited to the seniors only. Um, and in those patients' uh, young age, they also have similar amyloid formation, uh, am sorry, uh, plaque formation. Uh, there's actually two main types of plaques that are implicated in, uh, in Alzheimer's. There's what I just described, the amyloid beta plaque, which this shows. And there's another tau particle, tau uh, molecule, um, which I'm not gonna go into, go into right now, but, but it, it does similar things. It has its own uh, pathway at which it, it gets generated and created. Um, but the unique thing about tau is that tau actually is a, is a chimeric molecule. It has two forms of the molecule. It has a, a, a mirror image of the molecule. Only one of those images of the molecule is destructive. The other one is, is constructive. It helps in our, in our brain. Um, but what happens with tau is that when, when it reverts to this mirror image form, it becomes very destructive. And it can actually convert the, um, the normal tau particles into the mirror image form. And then these plaques build up from that. So it's a very different process. But nonetheless, they also form plaque. So no matter what types of plaque you have, whether it's amyloid beta or tau or, or there are other types also, no matter what type of, of plaque you have building into the network, it's all destructive. Um, so one of the things that, that, that uh, uh, sorry, actually not, uh, uh, I'm not sure why that, uh, sorry, I had another slide after that, that slide didn't, uh, Show, but um, so I'm just going to talk through it. So, so basically, what, what, what happens is after we, um, after these plaques start forming in the brain, um, there are many types of uh, disruptions. And, and again, plaque formation doesn't translate to Alzheimer's. Plaque formation doesn't mean the person will have Alzheimer's. Most people have plaque in their brain, and even some people even have large areas of, of you know, not not as large as we saw in the MRI image, but they have significant plaque formation. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to have or that they will have, have Alzheimer's. Um, this is one of the areas that we don't understand exactly how plaque can form but not cause um, problems in a person. What might actually be happening is that in those people when there is plaque, it might be that their brain is having a uh, disruption or, or, or lack of function, but it may be that their uh, mental machinery or you might, the, the, the network that their uh, brain has formed is so robust that it actually is not disrupted by these small levels of plaque formation that the brain has. And on this point, let me just make, make another point that um, I, I've said this in, in prior talks, but I, I, this is a point I think is important to, to repeat that when we think of the brain and we think about learning and, and understanding and uh, structures that have formed into the brain, one of the things that we've learned recently that, that in, in, through scientific studies, we've, you know, we've learned over and over through, through the last 10 years, is that when we have structures forming in our brain, especially in humans, but this happens in all animals, in all complex animals, um, when we have structures, structure, by structure what I mean is a set of interconnections between neurons that allow a certain behavior to happen. Okay, So that's a structure of, of, of a region of the brain where those neurons act together to provide, to do something specific. It might be that they, um, you know, uh, they give a sensation, they, they give a specific sensation, or it might be that they, they form to give a specific mem a visual memory. The, the, you know, it might be 50,000 neurons that together form together, um, or it might be, you know, only 2,000 neurons that, that have a simpler function. But these structures of neurons, when we form them, it's not that we only have one of these structures. Oftentimes when a person has, for example, the, the memory of, of a dog, memory of a favorite dog, let's say, okay? So if you form a structure that encodes the memory of your dog, okay, in many people, it's not that they only have one of these structures. It may be that they have more than one of these structures, or it may that maybe it, it 
could also, it, it sometimes is that they have multiple of these structures that are overlapping in space. So for example, out of, the, out of let's say 10,000 neurons that encode this memory of their dog, okay? The mem memory of remembering their dog, not just encoding the dog, because encoding the, everything about the dog would be much more than 10,000 neurons. That's a very complex thing, but encoding the simplest memory of your dog might be as simple as 10,000 neurons. So in that case, it might be that you may have a few different versions of encoding that memory of your dog, okay? And, and you may have multiple groups of 10,000 neurons encoding these different memories of your dog, but these multiple 10,000 groups may overlap or superimpose each other in space. So, you know, 2,000 of this group and 4,000 of this group may overlap and they actually share between each other. But the other remaining 6,000, the remaining 8,000 are distinct and separate. So it's a very complex thing about how we encode memories and how we encode uh, function in our brain. But the key point is that important things, and this is the reason why I, I, the example I chose is the memory of your own dog because your own pet would be important to you. So in that case, you would probably have more than one encoding of that memory. You would have multiple encodings of that memory. And so in the example of tau, uh, sorry, in an example of plaque formations forming, if the plaque formation happens to disrupt one or two of those memories, it would disrupt those. But if you have multiple memories that are not disrupted, then you would still be able to remember your, your dog. Okay, so in that case, you would have parallel memories. You would have supporting memories already existing in your brain. And this may be the reason why when people develop plaque, that it doesn't seem to affect them because they have multiple copies of their memories in their brain or multiple copies of these functional areas, functional units of their, in their brain. That may be an explanation. We don't know for sure. There's a lot we don't know about Alzheimer's. It's, it's, it's an area of, of tremendous research especially of diagnosis and treatment. You know, we're not there yet, but, but it's a very important area and, and it's being studied. But, but I want to go, I, I wanted to discuss just the area that, you know, when after plaques form, um, what they are doing is they're disrupting uh, many different behaviors in the brain. And because they're disrupting uh, so many things, we can have a lot of different problems that can happen in a person. So some of the things that happen, some of the um, disruptions that you know people would know about are memory uh, uh, difficulty with, with remembering things. Um, so memory uh, challenges, they would have difficulty with uh, performing certain actions. So for example, dr simple drawing tasks that they used to be able to do or, or um, uh, recognizing faces. Um, there may be specific areas. And again, this corresponds to where the plaques have built up because uh, this is this has been seen. This has been understood that the disruption that occurs in the person is correlated very strongly with the area where they tend to have high plaque buildup. So if it's in the motor regions of the brain, then there will tend to be higher degradation in motor skills. And because our motor skill is, our, our, sorry, our, our uh, motor, uh, sensory motor cortex is structured in a very very specific way, in that specific regions are 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 purposeful to enable specific motor function, single move, movement of one finger, um, single movement of our head, single movement of our left foot. These are all individual motions that are controlled by specific areas of our brain. So if the plaques form in those specific areas, we see, and we would expect to see, but we do see disruption in that specific motor skill in the person. So those are other examples of, of disruptions that happen. It correlates very strongly with with these formations of plaques. Um, we also see um, cognitive impairment in the person. Um, we see uh, at a later stage after this, this uh, affects deeper and deeper areas of the brain, even difficulty in, in uh, uh, not, not the planning of motion, which I talked about earlier. The motor skills are more around the planning and execution of motion, but it actually can be in the sensation of motion. And the, um, uh, for example, our breathing, our respiration, our respiration is not only the movement of our, of our uh, lungs, uh, of our diaphragm, which moves our lungs, but also other processes which act to regulate our breathing. So it may be in the regulatory processes of our heart and our lungs and, and other uh, life sustaining parts of us. So all, all of the, and these, these disruptions would happen much later in, in a person's disease. So all of these things would disrupt uh, specific, again, specific functions and activities in, in the person. So these correlate again to uh, plaque buildup in, in these specific regions. So what we are seeing in Alzheimer's in many dementias is that the plaque formation 
is tied very strongly with where with the locality of formation, as well as the expected function that should be disrupted by that locality. We tend to see that it is usually disrupting that locality. But at the same time, there are some cases where we don't see any disruption, even though there's flak buildup. And that's where we, you know, we it's suspected they may have um, superimposed uh, multiple uh, capability built up over time. Um, and this is actually something that we try to do to help people when they have strokes, for example. We, you know, one of the things that's done is you try to help have the person retrain themselves to build additional neural circuitry in the region that's that's uh, destroyed, that's damaged through the stroke. So there is there is a, um, a plasticity in the brain, you know, even normally um, that that may account for a lot of what happens in Alzheimer's, but um, it, it's very disruptive. So let me uh, let me stop here, um, and if you sure. want to have uh, Q and A or breakout, we can. Uh, yeah. Uh, what what I would like to do is, um, folks, let's focus on identifying the questions that we have. And the best way to do that is to do a very short breakout rooms. And in the breakout rooms, just try to brainstorm questions that you would like to put on the table. And then when we come back, put those questions on the table and we will go through all of them. The breakout rooms are going to be facilitated by uh, Sanjay and Joe. Um, the rules in the breakout rooms are very simple. Raise your hand when you want to speak or you can do it like this in the breakout rooms or type exclamation mark or raise your hand in Zoom. Um, keep on topic, try to keep your questions brief, go back and forth, come up, you know, just brainstorm the questions and then you can go ahead and ask them when we come back. They'll run only for 10 minutes and then we'll come back here because we're running a little late today. All right, folks, welcome back. Welcome back. Let's see, not everybody is back. Where is, oh, there. Okay, let me give a couple of minutes here. Okay, Sanjay is back. Uh, let's see, where is Joe? Joe is back, okay, very good. All right, um, so now it's time for questions. Let's collect all the questions. It's a little late, so I wanna, get all the questions and then choose selectively which questions to deal with. So that way we get the answers to the best question. We're gonna start with uh, Joe followed by Linda. Joe. Yeah, I mean, I, I think you've touched upon this already, uh, Sanjay, was the idea that what causes plaque to begin with, but actually what is one of the things that why one brain may be more uh, able to adapt or uh, the plasticity may be able to, they may be able to do use a different region of the brain versus say someone else. Like what is one of those defining factors? I imagine it has to do with genetics, but um, anyway, just- Wonderful. So I'll, I'll put it, it as, yeah, yeah I'll, I'll put it as what is the difference between plasticity of individual brains and what is the cause of that. Uh, next up is going to be Linda followed by Vanessa. Linda. Sanjay, you said that it was possible to have these plaques on an imaging study, but the person would not have dementia. Um, what would be the next step if plaque is seen on an imaging study? What's the next diagnostic step to ascertain whether it is dementia? Okay, excellent. Uh, next up is going to be Vanessa followed by Madeline and Dave. Vanessa, what's your question? Okay, the article mentioned that FEZ1 protein um, and the affecting how it affects the neural network and its building, if it's abnormal, if it affects the formation of plaque, if it makes more likely or where the plaque develops. Maybe okay. I phrased it better that way, so. Uh, thank you, thank you, Vanessa. Uh, next up is going to be uh, Madeline. Madeline, go ahead. Yes, uh, my question was, uh, what have led Sanjay to select these three different things and how he sees them uh, fitting together? Okay. The, the, the trichoplaques, the skin, and the plaques, the, the brain plaques. Okay, very good. Very good question. Uh, brain plaques. Okay. Uh, next up is going to be Dave followed by Laura. Dave. Yeah, thanks, Shikant. Uh I asked in the small group, but 
Uh, any preventative things for dementia or Alzheimer's, those of us of a certain age, it's a big fear. Thank you. Wonderful. Any pre preventative things for dementia or Alzheimer? Uh, Laura, what's your question? Um, is there any way that the plaques can be prevented from forming? Wonderful. Can plaque be prevented from form forming? Great. Excellent. All right. So, uh, Sanjay, how about starting with Madeline's question? How did you choose these three things? <laughs> right. <laughs> I enjoyed that. I was in the, we were in the same breakout room, so she uh, she did a, a test run of the question on me earlier. <laughs> so, I mean, for me, um, the uh, the idea of information is very important, and and all three of those areas had to do with information. So, the way I, I can explain it is that. The, um, the trip, triplex adherence organism, um, basically it has information, but the information is, is coming from the external world. It's not, it's not uh, complex information. It's dealing with minimum information and it's, we wouldn't say it's making its own decision, but that information is, is affecting what it does. Um, in the case of an information network, such as our skin, um, again, there's information, the information can be internal or external. So I, why, why I didn't go into other types of, of uh, cellular networks, you know, we have like a heart or a lung, those are also cellular networks, they have more complex types of information that they work on. But in those types of, of structures, the information is much more complex, dynamic, there's much more going on. Um, and that and, and that is more similar to what happens in our brain, our brain has a much, much higher level of information processing than any other that we know of. And then in the third case, um, with uh, Alzheimer's dementia or platforms, etc. What's happening is that the information that's uh, uh, being processed in any normal brain, uh, it's being disrupted. So there's a breakdown in the flow of information, and that's ultimately what causes the degradation of function in these diseases, that information stops flowing. So all three are tied together by information. Wonderful, wonderful. Uh, next, let's take uh, Joe's question uh, about plasticity of individual brains. Um, why is it that the plasticity of brains differ um, across individuals? What are the underlying uh, factors in that? So, um, I mean, this, this is, again, it's, it's a broad question, which um, the answer really has to do, I mean, and, and it's, there's three areas of, of uh, biological systems, three areas that impact biological systems the most. And this is another one of those where it's impacted by all three of those. Um, there's uh, nature, so our genetics is is definitely involved. Um, you know, our our hereditary, our um, ancestral, our parental lineage, etc. All of that puts put together um, encodes within our genes uh, how well um, our neural structure will form, how robust and how um, multiplicitous. You know, how much overlap and how much. Uh, redundancy will be built into our brain structures. That's one part of our DNA that encodes it, um, not just as humans, but as individual uh, trees and in the, in the human tree. Um, so genetics is one. Um, the environment that we grow up in. So if you grow up in an area, or if you grow up in an environment where you learn multiple languages, multiple spoken and written languages, then those parts of your brain that deal with languages will be so robustly formed. So learning, learning is, is the second part. So learning will cause parts of our brain to be very uh, um, strongly developed and overdeveloped in the sense that the plasticity will be built in through our learning, through our overlearning. And the third area is epigenetics. And epigenetics is, is more complicated to explain, but it's the overlap, it's the, uh, um, the integration between the day-to-day -day what's happening right now um, in our world, in our external and internal world, inside our body and outside our body, what's happening right now, as well as the forces that they translate into at the molecular genetic level in, inside every cell in our body and how our genes decode those forces and cause us to behave and do things, especially in our brain. Now that part we don't know as hardly know enough about, but the first two parts we know enough about that, for, and this is one of the reasons why, um, an example I gave earlier with strokes. If a person has a stroke uh, and stroke causes similar types of, of, not the same, but it, some of the um, 
uh, loss of function that happens in a person who's had a stroke are similar to some of the loss of function that happen in people with Alzheimer's, that specific areas of function get, get eroded and it sometimes get completely eradicated. So the treatment, the, the, um, one of the treatment uh, options presented is to train that person, is to give them the ability to use another part of their brain to retrain that function and to rebuild it in a different, slightly different location physically in their brain. So the redundancy factor. So plasticity is, is a powerful tool um, and, and you know, it, it's affected by all three of these things. Excellent. Uh, next, let's take the two questions that, um, that Laura and Linda put forth on plaque. Uh, why does plaque form? Is there a way of preventing it? Uh, if it does form, when does it lead to problems and when it does not lead to problems? Excuse me. Um, so, I mean, why plaque? Well, so there's many types of plaques that form. Um, and as far as, excuse me, and, and again, I'm not an expert in Alzheimer's, so I won't be able to go into depth with this. Um, and the purpose of the talk today was, was more around disruption in the network, in, in, in the neuronal structure. But, but of the types of plaques, I mean, the amyloid beta and the tau uh, plaque, and there's actually a few other that, that are implicated, but they're seen less. The first two are seen much more often um, in patients who have uh, uh, Alzheimer's. Um, there are um, other, and, and again, plaques are not the only thing that cause dementia or dementia-like illnesses. There are many types of, actually, multiple sclerosis also has plaque form. It is also affected by plaque formation. There's several other types of diseases. Um, Down syndrome also is affected by plaque formation. So plaques can, can do affect many, many types of um, uh, uh, um, diseases, which are affected by both brains and neurons and, and musculature. Um, so plaques can impact many parts of our body, but, um, and, and other disruptions other than plaques can also dis, uh, disrupt parts of our brain and functions in our brain. So it's not that, that plaques are the main thing. Plaques are one area specific to Alzheimer's. That's why I brought that up because I only looked at Alzheimer's tonight and plaque is, is a central part of Alzheimer's at least in our current understanding. Um, um, also, someone asked about, you know, what, what can we do? Uh, Let, let's do one thing. Uh, Laura, you have a question. Try to keep it very brief. Go ahead. You need to unmute. Go ahead. Dementia patients, do they also have plaque form or is that not true for so dementia? So dementia isn't a specific disease. Dementia is like a category, it's an umbrella. Um, so dementia is a term used to, it, 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 it's used to, to describe um, a set of symptoms, but those set of symptoms may be from one disease, they may be from another disease, they may be for a combination of diseases. Um, so loss of memory, basically loss of, loss of mental function in, across many domains um, falls under the umbrella of dementia. Um, so dementia is not a single, it's not a disease. It's a category. Let's, uh, uh, if you want to finish uh, what you want to say about plaque, uh, I want to take uh, Dave's question and broaden it. Uh, shall I go ahead and just take, do that? Um, just uh, one, one thing I want to add with, on sure. plaques is that um, I don't remember if it was Linda or, or, or Laura who asked this, but, but about as far as um, the diagnosis or, and how do you, how would you know if someone has uh, Alzheimer's or, or, or dementia or not? Um, I think somebody asked that, you know, based on the, on the MRI slides that I showed. Um, and really, the, right now, we don't have any uh, simple or cheap way of diagnosing uh, Alzheimer's um, and many dementias. Um, so, but there are some, especially in the last two or three years, there have been very, very powerful techniques that have been created, which seem to hold, hold our promise. The simple blood test, for example, that's not a test. But right now, the only there, there are only two methods right now to to definitively diagnose uh, Alzheimer's and and some dementias, and one is a biopsy, which can only be done after the person dies. But um, the other method is uh, what's known as a PET scan. I don't know if people know what a PET scanner is, but a PET scanner is another type of scanning technology, which is different from MRI, um, but it's much more expensive. That's the challenge because it it costs roughly eight thousand dollars a scan. Um, and, and you would need more than one scan. So it's very expensive, prohibitive in that sense. Okay, so now, now let's take the question that Dave has, uh, but let's broaden it. Um, you know, what can we do 
to prevent dementia or Alzheimer's, but let's make it broader than that. The thing is that all of us get older and all of us will lose some ability. And it's like, I, you know, in one sense, if people who are advanced in age are really interested in this question of what do I do to, to maintain my ability, you know, use of my brain for as long as possible. But, you know, from everything that we know about the brain is that you can't just start that at 80. You know, you really need whatever you do before also lays the groundwork. So it's not the question only for people who are advanced in age. So the question is, how, what do we, you know, from everything that you've learned? So I want to make it very broad. So you can take as much time as you want to talk about it. Um, from everything that you've known about the brain, what can we do to enjoy and fully use uh, and maintain the capability, increase the capability of our brain over a lifetime so that we enjoy the use of it way, you know, throughout our entire life. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so it, it's, it's, I mean, there are things we can do, but first let, let me say this, that when we're talking about these specific diseases, um, we don't know specifically what causes some of these diseases. Uh, so for example, with Alzheimer's, we don't have, we don't know for sure what it is that ultimately causes Alzheimer's. We have a very good, we have a very good, well-tested um, theory. And again, the word theory in science is different from the way people in, in the general public use it or, or understand it. A theory in science is not conjecture. It's not a guess. The theory is a very, very solid understanding. It's a very well-formulated idea. It's been tested robustly and rigorously, and it's the best idea we have. But like, you know, as we say in science, we, we can't prove something 100% ever. Proving something 100% is very, very difficult. So, um, so with Alzheimer's, we don't know for sure, but we have a pretty good idea. It seems to be around plaque. Um, again, we don't know uh, how much plaque is required because that varies from person to person. Um, we don't know if the plaque has to uh, begin a certain age or if there's particular types of plaque because there are actually certain types of plaque and certain types of brain cells that are more prone to plaque uh, degeneration from plaque buildup. So there's many areas in, in Alzheimer's that we don't know. Um, another uh, neuro neurodegenerative disease is, is uh, Parkinson's. So that's a disease where we know more about. The, um, the substantia nigra is a, is a core part of the brain, deep in the brain, um, in the central part, not, not in the thinking part of the brain, but the, uh, it's, it's closer to the brain stem, but it's actually in the, in the, um, the limbic area, um, which, which is essential for motor function, for the, our ability to move our muscles. Um, because almost every part of our, everything that we do when we move our muscles goes through that region. It's a tiny region, so there aren't a whole lot of cells there. And there are very distinct type of neuronal cells there. When those cells die, that causes Parkinson's. It's that simple, and that's known. Now, the reason why those cells die is a little more complicated and it varies from person to person. Sometimes it's uh, uh, genetics. Sometimes it could be lifestyle. Sometimes it could be toxicity from something. Um, sometimes it could be cancer. It could be some other disease. So very many reasons why, but and, and in a particular patient, um, the physicians would have to do a lot of exploration to figure out exactly what caused it in that person. Um, but overall, you know, how do we how do we avoid and present prevent a lot of this? Um, the simplest answer I can say, with, as far as the brain, as far as any part of our brain, is use it or lose it. Okay, that's the most simple and most succinct way to say it. Is if you stop using a function, and I'm going to explain this a little more in this, but if you stop uh, if you stop doing something, so for example, and and, and just a, a personal example of that is that. When, uh, when I was young, I knew several other languages. And when I was in high school, I was learning several languages. But I've forgotten a lot of those languages as I've gotten older because I haven't had a need to use them. But one of those languages, every once in a while, I meet people who speak that language and I will you know, push myself to use that language. And for a few days, I start remembering more. And that's an example of use it or lose it. I force myself to use it. But then a month later, I will probably start forgetting it again. Okay. But the key point here is to realize that even though I think I've forgotten it or I don't have the easy recollection or easy recall of that language, most of it is still in my mind. 
it's there. We, we don't really lose things that much unless there's actually a breakdown of the interconnections. That's when we lose something, when we lose the memories completely. That happens only much later in life or in some of these diseases. But if you, as long as you keep using your brain, parts of your brain, specific things, specific activities, you will reinforce those interconnections. That's important. The second part that's important is not only will you reinforce the interconnections, you may build parallel, resilient, redundant connections. And this is the most important part I can, I can say about this. This is the most important part, which seems to apply even in people who have early stages of Alzheimer's who don't have a lot of loss of function, is that they've, they've built up through their behavior and throughout their life, they've built up a lot of redundancy in their brain. So the example I gave about remembering our dog, right? If your dog is very uh, dear to you, right? If it's a very strong emotion for you, then more than likely your brain will have multiple redundant copies of the, your dog. You'll remember your dog in many, many different scenarios and situations. So for you to lose, completely lose all memory of your dog will be much harder than losing all memory of a person you met um, six months ago that you know, you're not going to see ever again, right? Um, so depending on the usage of that memory and the importance of that memory to you as a person, that will affect our ability to uh, function in spite of these neurodegenerative situations happening later in life. So use it or lose it, that's the simplest way I can say it. Wonderful, now the thing is that you know, each of us has a brain and each of us is in charge of it and each of us has strategies of dealing with this. So uh, I now welcome anybody who wants to share about what they are planning, what they do in order to maintain the use of their brain. Uh, Mike, you've unmuted. You have something to say? Okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, all right. Uh, next up is going to be Dave. Dave, what's your strategy? Well, I just want to throw something in the mix real quick because I saw an excellent article about Alzheimer's because I think everybody assumes it's a linear thing, but it's not. It's a major change. And think of it this way, that I might start forgetting some phone numbers, but if I have Alzheimer's, I can't figure out how to use the phone anymore. So it's, it's a radical thing. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Laura, what's your strategy for maintaining the use of your mind? You need to unmute. I want everybody to have faith. I finally am now able to memorize phone numbers. And if I have to look at, you know, one number on six digits on one page and have to type it somewhere else after 10 years, I'm now able to do that. So don't, don't give up. Um, uh, that's, I, I think that that's a very fundamental thing. Don't give up. Don't because, give up. You yeah. have to have faith that you can and will yes. remember things. I do. Yes. It's repeated. You have to repeat things a lot. You have yes. to talk to yourself, repeat things over and over, get them in your memory bank. You know, that's, you have to connect your information. And if it means repeating it a hundred times or writing it and reading it, and, re and there's just so many things you can do. Sure, Khan's right. You have to write things down. That's the most important thing. You have to remember that you wrote it down, of course. So you have to find ways of, you know, remembering to remember. That's the key. So What's how you can remember to remember, whether... <laughs> I, I put signs up all over in front of my door, remember this, and I walked past it a hundred times and left that. Always miss something every day. I missed one thing differently to get out of the house. So you have to play games with yourself, you know, today. And it's a, it's a, it's a trial and error, and you have to be patient. It's not easy. You know, you feel stupid a lot of the time, and I kick myself in my own butt most of the time for no reason, but you just have to hang in there um, and just, you know, I have trouble writing, so, and I travel typing, so I, I, you know, go to occupational therapy and find new ways of doing things. You have to be willing to change your style of life, you know? Wonderful. And so that's all I got to say, but I, I, I've, I had a, you know, we didn't really talk about, you know, um, traumatic you know, brain thing, yep. which comes no, let, on let's, yeah, uh, this is wonderful. But, I want to make sure that everybody gets a chance. Go for to, it. To come in. Thank, thank you. Uh, Laura, this was wonderful. I really appreciate it. It's really inspirational uh, because what happens is that, you know, you, it, just, it takes a lot of grit, you know, a lot, lot of, a lot of grit that that's what I would say in order to do this. Um, there are many people who give up with much lesser things, you know, so that's, that's great. Thank you. 
Uh, next up is going to be Jyoti, Vanessa, and Judy. Jyoti. Yeah, I've been saying it for years. I think exercise and uh, diet is the way to go. And uh, I read an article today, I'll be very quick. They're injecting the, um, the sedentary and the Alzheimer's rats with the bloods of the athletes. And they are finding out that they are uh, becoming look younger and they, their learning and their memory has improved considerably. And now they are going to try to do it on the humans. And then you know what's going to happen. Who gets it? <laughs> it's this, okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Jyoti. I mean, it, it's a question of kind of safety and stuff like that. I don't think there's going to be a it's limit. A uh, next up is going to be uh, Vanessa followed by Judy. Vanessa. I kind of do like maybe like circuit training for your um, with exercises more efficient and more productive. Why well, do something similar? I call uh, Weird Al, if you know Weird Al Yankovic, or maybe a couple of melodies I know. So one, you have to come up with the songs like poetry. If you want them to rhyme, you got to keep with the same rhythm. And then if there's one trying to mix it up, so like I said, you're between trying to keep the rhyme, keep the beat, and great if you can stay on pitch, and if it's a really great day, also trying to dance to it as I'm walking down the street, especially if I want people to make them chuckle, you know, bring some sunshine in their voice and think, okay, this we got this freak out there, I'm not so bad. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Vanessa. Next up is Judy. I'm going to learn how to read music and to tune a piano. I'm going deaf in one ear. And the other one is kind of going also. So I think this is forcing myself to really focus on hearing, I think will stimulate my brain. Wonderful. Uh, anybody else wants to talk about their own strategies? Um, I, my, my strategy is to do 52 living ideas, these meetups, and that's it's a very powerful way of keeping your mind fully engaged with uh, so many people, so many subjects, so many new things. Uh, like for example, uh, on Mondays, we have started doing poetry, which is relatively new to me. Um, I'm not a religious person. We have been studying religions. We've been studying gospel and uh, Tao Te Ching. It's, they are very different ways of thinking. Uh, you know, the, the Chinese way of thinking is very different and it really expands. Um, what your brain can do. Um, it's, it's a very slow process. It kind of has to grow on you and you need to have the patience to do that. Uh, but it can like Bhagavad Gita is doing the same thing uh, for me. And uh, so, so that's um, all right. Uh, anybody else? Uh, Laura, you had a quick comments. Go ahead. Yeah, I was going to recommend 52 living ideas. That's the way to go. And that's the way to stay young because they're going to be 800 more times 800 more times 800 more. It's an infinite yes. cycle. So we're all going to stay young, folks. We're just going to be like this. We're going to be, we'll be here 10 years from now looking the same in our little boxes. So. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, uh, Laura. Next up is Marilyn, followed by uh, Joe. Marilyn. Yeah, um, I've read that a uh, a much higher proportion of Alzheimer's patients have type two diabetes than the general population does. So I think a good strategy would be to avoid that and uh, keep your blood sugar normal and stable. Um, the other thing was uh, one time I asked my neurologist, uh, you know, which, which mental things were best for sharpening the brain and he said, you know, there's no specific thing. The best thing you can do for your nervous system is vigorous whole body exercise like running or swimming. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Madeline. Next up is Joe followed by Dave. Joe. Yeah, I think um, uh, exercise and as well uh, as limiting the amount of sugar that you take in is both, they're both very important, but uh, I also would say that that you're continually pushing yourself. Um, and what I mean by that is by failure. Necessarily, you're not necessarily just doing what you're good at doing. You're pushing yourself into something to the unknown. 
and so where you're working in something different. Uh, I think that that's kind of, that's critical uh, because if you're not failing, you're not really trying, so. Excellent, excellent point. Uh, thank you, Joe. Next up is Dave. Plugging these 52 living ideas, uh, as far as Zooming, aren't we on about a, like a two year anniversary here? Yeah, yeah, I, exactly. It's It's we, been two years. I think we're years. Party, don't we? Or, or maybe uh, we should do a special session about uh, greatest things I learned last two years. How about that? Huh? Absolutely, absolutely. We, we try, uh, uh, great, great idea. Thank you. We um, need a big party for uh, that, actually. Yeah. Thank you. Um, we, we'll we'll work on something. I I see that way way I'm looking at it is that I don't see I, I you know I don't know maybe maybe I'm silly but I'm I'm just focused on saying what what can we do, and I'm just kind of relentlessly trying to come up with things. So, uh, so firstly, um, I mean I'm quite firstly I'm I'm really grateful for the for the community. I mean it's just amazing that such people show up, such thoughtful thoughtful people show up and they engage in such a deep dialogue. Um, I mean, this is very rare um, to have these many people from these many different backgrounds, different places, all talking. Um, the range of topics we've, we cover is very large. Uh, we always take up new things like Tao Te Ching, Bhagavad Gita are good examples of that. Um, neuroscience, I mean, the, the what we are doing, uh, what Sanjay is doing on neuroscience is really remarkable. I mean, it's just, you know, this is a, this is basically the owner's manual, you know, for, for our brain. It's a very poorly written uh, owner's manual at this stage of our knowledge, but still you need it. You know, you need to take in everything that you know, and then you can say, so what, and start using it as best as we can. Um, so uh, it's, it's been amazing. We just launched the poetry series, which is producing something completely different, which is basically just expressive power that people have. And it is really astounding to see what people are able to do. So it's just a very wide variety of things. And I'm about to launch, we are about to launch a new series where it's a much more flexible, where people can choose different topics they want to talk about and just one meetup dedicated to a different topic. And I invite uh, anybody who is interested to propose different topics. You can send me a message on the meetup. You can talk to me. You can uh, go ahead and send me uh, email at 52livingideas at gmail.com. Um, so I look forward to the, we are doing a series on uh, Harry Potter, possibly. We're doing something on Japanese. We're doing something on uh, the divine feminine. We are doing something on Nassim Taleb. Uh, so there is all kinds of ideas that are floating around. And I invite you to take, uh, take um, initiative. Um, one thing I want to say, and there are a few people here who have done this, you get more value if you speak. Just like brain is not a receptive orga organism. You know, it's like, if you say, if you just watch TV, that brain doesn't do much. But when you start producing things, when you start making something, then actually the brain does something, okay? The same thing applies to meetups. If you present more, you will get more from the meetup. Uh, I don't know, uh, you know, Sanjay has presented, uh, you know, uh, Joe has presented. Joe, what do, what do you say? What do you think? The value of presenting. No, I, I, I think it's the most important thing that you can do because even as I said, you're kind of pushing yourself. Uh, you're not, it's, I like how you said it the other night where you said it's not a spectator sport. And, and it's, this is a, this is something where you're participating and then you're getting this immediate feedback that allows you to actually determine what you really, you know, need to work on or what, how you would have answered something differently, what you would have said differently. And that's invaluable uh, because then when you're, when, and you're in conversations, it makes it a lot easier to, to, um, uh, to think on your feet. 
Yeah, absolutely. So I, I'm going to list a bunch of things. And first, I'll, I'll have Sanjay. Sanjay, what do you think? What is the value of doing presentations? You've been doing presentations for Greater Philadelphia Thinking Society for this one. What, 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 what would you recommend it to other people? Of course, definitely. Um, I, I think, I mean, uh, you know, what Joe said also is very important that, that it helps you personally in, in how you function, how you interact with people. Um, I, th I think that for, for me, what, what I've noticed is, and, and I, I actually, this is the Zoom format is different from presentation, but I've done presentations professionally for many years. But presentation, I mean, what, what Joe said also, what you said is, is very important that it helps you think on your feet. It helps you realize um, that, I mean, for me, what, what it, one of the things that it did early on for me is helps you realize you're more capable than you realize. Um, you can actually handle situations that might be fearful um, because everybody has uh, stage fright. Everybody has a fear of public speaking. That's natural in everyone. But when you've done it enough times, you start to realize uh, and you start to build up skills. You start to build up techniques in how you uh, do things. You know, so one of the, you know, e even even now, I one of the fears that I have, not fear, but one of the concerns I have is that I might be asked a question that I don't know or or that I don't have a good answer for. But now that doesn't bother me as much. In the beginning, it did, but now it doesn't bother me as much because I don't have to give the best answer. I don't even have to give the answer. Sometimes, if I don't have an answer, I'd say I don't have an answer, um, which is fine. Part of it is, is, is uh, so when you're talking about presentation, it's, you know, one part is we're trying to communicate with people, right? We're trying to communicate what we believe and what we know or what we think. Um, so the external, but there's also another side of it, which is very important is that you're getting to see how other people think and you're getting to see other ideas that you might not be have, have experienced or, or aware of. And that is for me, much more, much more stimulating. That's really a powerful part of this. Yeah, I mean, um, see, I do this uh, quite a bit. Um, I do many kind of mini, even mini presentations. It could, firstly, it's scalable in the sense that it doesn't have to be like a two hour presentation. It could be just five minutes of saying something that is meaningful. Uh, even that will do wonders for you. So that's one point. Um, so I'll, I'll describe to you my experience of whenever I'm trying to uh, doing, or whenever I'm doing a presentation. Uh, firstly, I, I do presentations only on things that I don't know, that I'm trying to figure out, okay? That's the only thing I, I like to do presentations on. So what happens is that moment I say, okay, I'm going to do a presentation, I notice a change in myself. This is even before doing the presentation because I am trying to now put everything in a far more organized way because you kind of grasp things as, a, at least my mind grasps things as a whole, and when I'm saying that, okay, I have to communicate it to somebody, I have to figure out what is the proper order, what is the pro proper hierarchy? What is the thing that they will immediately say, oh, you know what, that is worth looking at. What is it that they can say, oh, this I know, I can, this is something that, that I can build something from. Then I want to, so you can kind of structure your presentation, the process of structuring the presentation. I find it very useful for me of structuring what, whatever I know. Um, next is that even the, I, I like to work on, you know, I do Google Slides. That process, it's the same as the point that I make about writing. You know, when you write things out, you can look at it and you can say, did I capture everything? Is it precise enough? Is it the right organization? What is missing? Um, what can be cut? all of that really improves your grasp of it. So before you actually start presenting, you've gotten a good 50 to 60% of the value right there. So that is one big thing. So you will do that on your own just because you're going to present to people, okay? The second thing is that the presentation itself, what it does is that it is, combination. I, I, this, this medium, uh, by the way, of, um, of slides, it's actually a very powerful medium because you have something written and then you're talking about it. So you have the written work, which shows the structure, which shows the kind of the schematic of it. 
and then you're talking through it. You're actually looking at faces of people and say, okay, this looks a little bit confusing to people. Let me explain a little bit more. Uh, so you have this way of action. So this kind of envelope of written and oral. So in some ways I get another level of things when I'm talking things out. And what I say, I never prepare in detail. I just have a bullet point and I, everything that I have is there on the slides. So that's the framework that I use. And then I'm talking through it. So that itself adds another level. Then you are always surprised by the different questions that you get and different observations that you get. As you know, Sanjay was saying, you are going, you know, basically, no matter how hard you try, you are locked into whatever perspective you have. You may try very hard to look at it from multiple perspectives, but even the, the scope of that is limited by your context. What, especially an audience like this, where everybody has such goodwill for each other, they have, they come with their own context. They are kind of confident about themselves. They feel, they are generous to actually give you feedback, tell you when they disagree with you. They will do it very nicely, but they will tell you that they disagree with you. And all of that is dramatic. It is the cheapest way of improving your understanding of something. Because here are a bunch of people who are telling you from giving you, like you're talking about expanding your context, this is the easiest way of expanding your context. But you have to listen very closely, okay? That listening is very important because you have to kind of put yourself in their shoes. I'm not very good at doing that, but I try. So you, you try to understand where they're coming from. And what that does is that that adds to the richness of it. Um, so by the time it is all done, the other thing is that at a personal level, what happens is that you are telling people about what is important to you, how you think. That is going to improve your interaction with everybody, with everybody in the group. So it improves your interaction with the community, the community, you are offering more to the community and the community can offer more to you because it is, you're putting some, some of yourself on the table. So these are some of the things that I, you know, I, I get from it. And I completely agree with everything that Joe says and everything that uh, Sanjay says. Uh, and um, so, uh, and again, you know, I'm very, very thankful to Joe. I'm very, very thankful to Sanjay for, you know, for par participating so actively in this. Uh, so, so that's, that's what I had. Um, all right, folks. So um, we have, uh, I just want to quickly tell you about the meetups coming up. Uh, we're doing Bhagavad Gita meetups. Those are going in incredibly well, incredibly well. We've got uh, somebody uh, from India who is a scholar of Sanskrit, who has read all the major Sanskrit commentaries on Bhagavad Gita, all the background materials, all the Upanishads, every, every, all the background in Sanskrit. And he, um, and I'm, I'm reading this Nyaneshwar's commentary, which is amazing popularization of uh, Gita to people who can't even read or write. Um, so it's, it's really, really special. So those are on Thursdays and Fridays. On Mondays, we have the series on poetry uh, that is being led by Maritza. On Tuesday, we are wrapping up Dao De Jing and we are going to start these um, user-generated, you know, attendee uh, presentations on different topics. So I invite you to line up for those. We already have one on comparing Epicureanism and Stoicism by somebody who has not presented before. Uh, we can do it in a group. So if you are interested in talking about something, just talk to me. I'll figure out a format that will work for you. Uh, on Wednesdays, of course, we're doing this Comprehensivist Wednesdays. We've got all kinds of other stuff going on on the weekends. Um, and uh, so it's always an honor to have you here. And uh, Sanjay, thank you so much. This was, this was just great. All right. See you folks soon. Bye, everybody.